Greetings, Dr. Beckett. Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast. In 2017, the military gathered a small group of scientists to try and bring the Quantum Leap time travel program back online. Five years later, believing it was the only way to save his fiancée's life, Dr. Ben Song risked everything when he entered the accelerator to travel back in time. He awoke to find himself trapped in the past, facing mirror images that were not his own, and driven by an unknown force to change history for the better. Ben believed he would only need to complete 18 leaps before he could return to the place and people he calls home. But something went wrong. Ben! No! And for reasons unknown, Ben did not leap home. You are listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. This is episode 155, Off the Cuff. Watch it, I've got fragile bones. This is false imprisonment, I told you. I'm innocent, you've got the wrong guy. I'm a bounty hunter. Ow, 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 ow. Come on, man. Nick Peterson, Carvio Lawrence. Okay, so you are definitely lost. Yeah. Maybe a little. How about first impressions? Do you think this equation can bring Ben home? It's too soon to tell. Who even wrote this? Well, we don't know. It's part of a scrap DARPA project. None of the engineers were named. But if there is something here, DC wants us putting all our resources into it. No, 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 there, there's definitely something here. Okay, so I'm Nick Peterson. You are former NYPD, first precinct. Now you are a bounty hunter. You should have experience, right? Who's my Gabby friend? Kevin Zatt. Esquire. A lawyer. Kevin's client list is a who's who of the criminal underworld. Mobsters, drug runners. His crown jewel is Sonny Fox, who happens to be one of the world's most dangerous arms dealers. It turns out he was skimming from his clients too. Okay, in the original history, he skipped bail, slipped your custody, and Fox's enforcers found him, tortured him, killed him, and that is the PG-13 version. Okay. But I can't be here just to make sure Kevin goes to jail. According to Ziggy, that is exactly why you're here. This is... this is a lot. I literally saw you yesterday, and now so much has changed. In nine years. Look, maybe we just let this sink in. Because if you're here, that means somebody's in trouble. Actually, I think I'm here for Kevin. Well, if there was ever a soul in need of saving. You think so, too? Okay, well, that's good to hear because Josh doesn't seem as on board. Well, Kevin and my husband have a complicated history. No, he's got nothing on our complicated history. Ben, your bond agent double-crossed you. She'll be here any minute. Is that Addison? Who's Addison? What's she saying? What's who saying? That we're not safe, that the men who want to hurt Kevin are going to be here any minute. What? Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast, everyone. I'm Christopher D. Philippus. I'm Allison Pregler. And today we are back talking about Quantum Leap. The back half of the second season has begun, and uh, we are happy to be talking about episode nine, Off the Cuff. And uh, yeah, um, I, it's a little awkward, isn't it, Allison? I mean, this is our first right. episode. <laughs> without matt like right. got everybody listening i mean we're, we're figuring this out as as we go um i mean we wanted to begin by acknowledging that uh because we just want to be upfront about everything this is a journey for us as much as it's been a journey for you but uh, just the outpouring of support that all of you out there have given us was invaluable in getting us through yeah. Yeah, this this difficult time. It, it was just an amazing coming together of the fan community, and we definitely want to start by thanking all of you out there for for reaching out. It it I I can say personally, it helped me immensely. Yeah, same. It's um, it's it's been so nice to see all of the the outpouring of love from people, and I know it's meant a lot to us, and I know it's meant a lot to his family. Oh, for sure. So um, I've been in some contact with Sharon and with uh, Matt's best friend, Kevin. They had some comments, too, and uh, we're going to be featuring those later on in the program. So stay tuned for that. But um, I guess maybe we should just outline going forward how we plan to do the podcast. We have the final five episodes to wrap up season two, and... It will culminate on February 20th with a two-hour finale. We've been told that the two hours, it's just they're just going to air two episodes back-to-back. -back. It's not like a two-parter. Yeah, that was my understanding. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm hoping that we get the screeners in time to do everything so that we can do a double show on the 20th to review those two episodes. And then what I'd love to do the following week is to, on February 27th, air the final show that Matt, Allison, and I did together. That was our review of the classic series episode, Blind Faith. So... um, it's been tough for me. I've been sitting there looking at that file saying, okay, you need to edit that. Everybody needs to hear Matt's final show. And I've just not had the gumption to do it. But that will air on the 27th. In that episode, I plan to do an addendum to feature the comments that we got from everybody in support of Matt and his family, just so that we can highlight all of the love that you guys have sent. And uh, it will also help prepare us for a Leap Day special that we have planned in Matt's memory. So I don't want to get too much into the details of that Leap Day special, um, but it's going to be something pretty big, and we're still figuring it out with the parties involved. I will say that we will have at least two special guests that are already confirmed, and we will be telling you more about that, giving more details as things do get nailed down. So stay tuned uh, for the you know, say again, God. So stay tuned over the next. Yeah, Sorry. I know. <laughs> and I interrupted you. <laughs> no, it's okay. I've been, I've been honestly, I've had such anxiety about getting on mic. I, I couldn't sleep last night. Anyway, so stay tuned. Keep listening. We'll give you more details as we nail everything down. But it's going to be big. It's going to be fun. And it's something that I know Matt would have loved. Honestly, it's something we probably wouldn't have been able to do without Matt's direct help and his his hard work and everything that he's done for the show. So I think it's going to be a fitting tribute to Matt's memory. Definitely. So, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, and, I mean, there's so much going on today. Uh Hey, uh, have you noticed Allison is back? Hi, Allison. Hi. Hi. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to cover, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is your first episode discussing the new series since somewhere in the midpoint of season one. So yeah, since uh, Family Style. Oh, it was Family Style. Okay, I was wondering which one it was. It just seems like you know ancient history, like way back in the mists of memory. And I have a shitty memory, <laughs> but uh, can you tell us what has your journey been with the new show since you stopped doing the episode reviews of the new show? Tell us, tell us how you're feeling about Quantum Leap these days. Well. uh... I wanted to start off the top. Uh, I don't want to make this all about me here. Um, But, you know, since Matt's passing, you know, it's really made me rethink a lot of things. And uh, I just didn't, I don't want to be this negative force anymore, Uh, especially for things that really, it it doesn't matter that much, you know, to be that angry. Um, So, you know, I wanted to start things fresh, and uh, the people involved with the show uh, have been nothing short of wonderful uh, to Matt and his family and to us. So um, I wanted to start things over. I wanted to catch up on the show, restructure the way that I think things, and uh, so I, I wanted to to follow this journey through. So I, I caught up on the show, and uh, I did find a lot of things to enjoy in it you know i was laughing at things that you know were supposed to be laughed at and uh (laughs) i was touched by things and uh i i I see how the show is evolving as it goes along well i'm glad that you've decided to jump on and uh i'm really glad that you're finding things to like in it and uh i really i i feel like you know if i'm going to podcast about quantum leap going forward there's no one i'd rather do it with so i'm i'm happy that uh, we're back on mic together. Thanks. I'm really glad to be discussing this with you. You know, I I miss doing these with you, even, you know, though we were doing the the classic episodes. Like, I'm really glad to be doing this. Well, I'm glad to have you. And let's talk about off the cuff. But um, before we get started, we have an interview to announce. We got to talk to the main guest star. His name is David Clayton Rogers. He plays Kevin Zat in the episode. David talked to Albie and me about being on the show. So we will bring you that interview after the break. Stay tuned for that. Allison, I have been waiting to ask you this for for over a year now. What are your (laughs) initial impressions on this new episode of Quantum Leap? How about first impressions? I I liked the energy of it a lot. Um, And I liked the the guest star. I liked David Clayton Rogers. I thought his uh, comedic timing was really good in this. I liked seeing how the story... uh, 
progressed because it threw some curveballs at us and uh, I had a good time. That's cool. Yeah, I, I had a good time with this one, too. Um, I was thinking it was a little bit of um, a small return, right? It was a quiet episode to come back from a uh, season hiatus. But at the same time, it was so evocative to me of the classic series in so many ways. There are elements here, and we'll get to it in the discussion, that reminded me very much of Quantum Leap of Yore. And... It was just bolstered by such a great guest cast. We had uh, David Clayton Rogers. Like you said, his timing was fantastic, and he was really a highlight of the episode. But also Josh Dean, who played Josh, uh, the husband in this, and the return of Eliza Taylor and Peter Godot. I think that their stories in this were good as well. So I feel like this episode in many ways was a good package for fans of Quantum Leap, old and new. And uh, I was I was happy to be watching it. Yeah, and I think everyone got like a little bit of something, even if people didn't have as big of a role in the episode. I felt like all of the characters had like something that I liked, something going on in the episode. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's funny to me that we have been leaping into a bounty hunter again. <laughs> I, mean, I was like, again? We're, do again? we're doing this again? But I do think it was different. And I think that this episode did uh, accomplish the comedy better. Than the uh, the Justin Hartley episode, even though like you know there was some stuff that worked in that one too, but um I think like this one they had it down better. Like I think they figured it out a little more solid than before. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's evident that this cast is more comfortable in their roles, and I think Raymond is so much more centered in Ben now that he can pull yeah. off just about any nuance that he has to all on the same scene. It, it's amazing to me how much they ask him to do and how well he pulls it off. He's really embraced the character. And, uh, I, you know, I, I want to talk about the bigger things because as far as episodes go, I don't want to say this is like an average episode, but this is not like a big reveal episode or anything. I think, you know, I think those are some of the best episodes, though. I live for the smaller ones, you know, because like the big epic ones, if it's all big and epic, you know, you don't appreciate all of the things in between, like, or you don't appreciate like how much, uh, how epic it is if it's like that all the time. I like the, the dips, you know? <sighs> Oh, no, yeah, and and yeah. Let me let me sort of temper what I said there. I I didn't mean like I don't think the episode itself is worth talking about. It's just that I am busting with just questions of like the bigger plot line and sort of the bigger lore. story elements. And yeah, maybe <laughs> but lore. What about the lore? <laughs> what about the lore? Chris is like the lore. I love the lore. And what the about lore. the radio? The radio. <laughs> There's that radio, damn it. There's a radio. What was the radio? I couldn't figure it out. Oh, it's in the basement. It's uh, behind. Kevin when he's holding his hands up and the lights are shining into the uh, into the basement and it's also behind Ray in a couple of scenes so it's green yeah that's and the I, real season mystery I, isn't yeah it? I think it's a radio I think it's a radio it could be a bread box I don't know I have to get a better picture it looked of it. like a radio to me but it's kind of hard to tell <laughs> So, okay, that's the most important part of the show out of the way. But uh, <laughs> So do you want to begin on, on the leap plot? Do you want to begin on the bigger questions? Where do you want to take the conversation first, Allison? Well, you said you wanted to get into the big stuff, so I'm fine starting there. All right, look, if you're going to leave it in my hands, let's talk about the biggest question that I have for this episode. Is Ben leaping himself? It sure seems like Ben is leaping himself. Oh, because, because he keeps coming across Hannah? I think so, but... Uh, there's a specific line, and I think that they even played it in the previously on Quantum Leap, where when he leaps out of Cairo before he does, he says to Hannah, From now on, I go forward. And lo and behold, he leaps forward. And not only does he leap forward, he leaps back to where Hannah is. It can't be a coincidence. I don't know. I mean, if he's leaping himself, uh, why did he leap himself out at the end before he could warn Hannah about what's going to happen to Josh? Yeah, I, I I don't know. Maybe he was he was a uh, what is it? Selfish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> radical selfishness. Radical selfishness. He's, subconsciously, he's like, oops, guess I couldn't tell her. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, sorry Josh. Josh. Sorry. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe it's, you know, um, something seems to be bringing him together with Hannah for some reason. Um, maybe he's doing it himself. Maybe it's uh, God time fate or whatever. Maybe it's uh, 
There's no limits to love. Love is bringing them together. Uh, <laughs> love, love, love will bring us together. Us together. <laughs> <laughs> We're a regular Elton John and Kiki D over yeah. here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking that we have been getting a lot more this season, and I've been like a broken record on this, but about questions of faith and questions of higher power maybe directing things. And when we spoke to Dean earlier in the season, I had brought up these questions with him and he gave me a nod saying, it's, you know, it is there. You're not going crazy. We are putting some of that stuff back in. So I feel like at this point, maybe we're at a, a place where Ben could be directing his leaps but there is still maybe a higher power that is also trying to get some kind of agenda accomplished i don't know what that higher power is is it gtf dubs maybe is it something else i mean what kind of agenda you mean like a bigger picture type thing or you yeah. mean yeah like... yeah and okay. i guess we'll we'll know by the end of the season or if anyway if i'm onto something here and there is a bigger story in the works. Maybe this is part of building towards that, but we just keep going back to the idea of agency. We keep going back to the idea of the accelerators putting them together. The accelerator seems to be the the catch-all for the forces that they don't understand here. So if the accelerator is doing this what's in that accelerator what is what is the engine for the accelerator making these decisions i it's i understand that they're trying to say it in terms that are germane to the show germane to the lore of quantum leap and you know you have ziggy you have the accelerator chamber we seem to have sidelined ziggy except for getting the data dumps and if Ziggy's not directing the leaps, they keep on saying the accelerator's doing this, the accelerator's doing that. They've been doing it since Martinez crashed the project back before uh, Judgment Day. So I, I'm, I just keep seeing more here, but now I feel like Ben might be taking more agency. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see him, you know, he's he's driving the plot forward more. You know, before it was kind of sometimes he would react to things like he didn't really know what was going on. I do feel like he's taking more of a proactive approach. Yeah. And in so doing, you know, if if we're going to accept that Sam was leaping himself, we know it's a different project, a different build, different parameters there. You know, he doesn't have some of Sam's limitations, but um, he doesn't have some of the advantages Sam had either. So does it work the same? I don't know. I guess it remains to be seen. But these are the kinds of things that I can't I can't help. I, I like the episode. I like the feel of the episode. I like the guest stars. But it just keeps on bringing up these bigger questions to me. So I'm, I'm sort of glad that they're dabbling in it. And I'm glad that we see Hannah again. It's nice to not have an episode lull. It's, it's for her to be in two episodes back to back is kind of a treat. I think that might be the first time this season we've done that. Oh, see, I just binged all of it. I didn't have to wait. <laughs> like you i just went through it and i'm like here's hannah and then here's hannah again all right <laughs> you know ben, ben falls hey, hard pretty quickly <laughs> yeah hear me out on this one um yeah yeah ben and hannah get together and uh sammy joe too <laughs> <laughs> it's well, all been planned <laughs> sammy joe too aka jeffrey Is yeah jeffrey... yeah i don't know if jeffrey's gonna come into play i feel like jeffrey we might see him in the future i'm not sure about hannah how it's all going to shake out with that but i feel like there's going to be something especially because jeffrey's such a smarty pants right i mean jeffrey yeah. was working with his mom on uh the whatever I, i'm not hydro. as smart as them whatever hydro uh, yes i wrote it down yes it was a <laughs> hydroelectric turbine and i like yeah. to call it the the hydroelectric turbine ex machina in this episode it sure did help them out resolving yeah. the plot they, they did a lot of good setup and payoffs i will say there are a couple of things in this episode that were just, you know, because show. I should put the because show section back in this because there were some very convenient um, coincidences. And again, like Ben is back in Jersey. So obviously to me, he's bringing himself to where he knows Hannah might be. But then they're on this bus in the middle of nowhere 
and they go into the bathroom of this luxurious bus, which obviously has what, a huge what bathroom. What is this bathroom? <laughs> what is the, this bathroom is like the size of half the bus. <laughs> it's like, I don't think, what bus are they on in the 70s that has this giant bathroom in it? But And and I don't know if you've ever been in a bus bathroom, but I don't think there are any windows in a bus bathroom either. I feel like so, you wouldn't have like a giant window you could jump through, certainly. <laughs> It's like a bus that's, bathroom with a view. some stuff that that's, was kind of magic in this episode. You got the TARDIS bus with the, the giant bathroom inside. Yeah. You got Ben uh, just magically taking his uh, coat on and off between cuts with handcuffs on, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> I didn't notice that. You have to point that out to me. Is he, that, is yeah, it... when when he's on the phone, because obviously he's taking the cuffs on and off sometimes, like to uh, chain him in the bathroom or whatever. So it's not like he hasn't taken them off, but he doesn't have a jacket on when he's uh, talking on the phone outside the bus. And then when they get on the bus, he has the jacket on. And I don't think there's enough time for that. Or if there was, he had to have like just whipped it on and off, you know, with the I don't know. I feel like that's just, you know, for timing reasons, maybe they cut something. They did have to buy tickets at some point. So maybe he, he put yeah, it back yeah, on maybe. when they were getting the tickets. I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, I that, that phone booth scene, I, I guess maybe we're talking about the bus. The other thing is just to stay on the bathroom for one more minute. Don't you think if somebody kicked the back window out of your luxurious bus bathroom and then literally, literally jumped out, <laughs> would the driver kind of pull over and say, hey, what's going on here? Yeah, th that driver doesn't care. They, I don't know. This is it was reminding me of they had a bus scene in the the um the original Quantum Leap in the uh the Bounty Hunter episode, and uh, they they had like the bus driver that like was kicking them off just because of like uh, hat fights and stuff. Like, <laughs> excuse me, get off of my bus! I don't want no trouble. Like, I don't know. There's a a, a theme of like bus drivers that just don't care. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought that up because this episode was so evocative to me, and I think deliberately so, of a hunting we will go, especially in the phone booth. Deliberately? I think, yeah, because there are too many different little nods. Like, I feel like this episode is channeling a hunting we will go and her charm. And there are other callbacks, some specific things that they say that are evocative of things Al has said in the original series. So it feels to me like the writer on this, his name is Alex Berger, is maybe a fan of the classic series. Um, unfortunately, he's not someone we're interviewing for this episode, but... But he's going to be over on Fate's Wide Wheel, I believe, anyway. That's what Albie told me, that Fate's Wide Wheel got the writer this time. So curses awesome. Fate's Wide Wheel. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, that just means like more interviews, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm only teasing. But uh, I'm very interested to uh, listen to that, to see Alex's take on this, because there was so much stuff in here, again, that I... I, I, I'm forced to believe that it can't be coincidental that it is so evocative specifically of other episodes of this ilk from uh, the classic series. And uh, even the comedy aspects, I was watching the performance of David Clayton Rogers and um, his character was just so funny throughout the thing. I couldn't help but think of Jane, Jane Sibbett, who played um, Diane McBride in a Hunting We Will Go. If you recall, when we did that episode, Allison, I liked her performance so much that I thought that she, if they could find a way to introduce Jane Sibbett as a regular character, they should have, because it was such a fun episode. It was so funny. So I, I don't know that um, I buy that it's just a coincidence that we have a similar dynamic here. Like, I, I really think that this is an homage as much as it is a continuation of the new series. I mean, it might be. I feel like this is also a little bit of a stock plot they're going off of, and that might be why there's some similarities, but it's possible that it is inspired by that episode. I mean, there are a lot of similarities, but it may be for that reason. Yeah. But I do think that it's different enough that it, it felt like its own episode. It didn't feel like derivative of it or anything. Yeah, no, no, for sure. When I talk about it in these terms, I mean strictly in terms of homage, like in a good way. Like, it, it, sure. I feel like I feel like this is Quantum Leap. It gave me a feeling of watching sort of a classic episode, but I also enjoyed it in the context of the current series. So it stuck the landing, yeah. whatever the intent was, you know, and if even if I'm reading too much into it, it still all works in both contexts. Sure. 
And I think like they did a good job um, of making it feel like the leap was important and the Hannah stuff intertwined with it really well because it was part of her story too. It didn't feel like the overarching story of the season was just slamming into it and like slamming the brakes, you know, on what yeah, was going yeah. on. So that was nice. Yeah, and that's something they've gotten really good at this season is mingling all of the different elements together in a much more cohesive way. Because I know one of your yeah. biggest issues in the first season was it felt like two different shows. And now that you've watched everything, you've said that you're finding more to like and more things are, are working for you. Has that aspect improved in your estimation? I do think it's improved a lot. I think like they, they still sometimes at the project have a lot of um discussion about things and not as much demonstration of it you know like they talk about their feelings a lot but it's i would rather see a scene of two people loving each other rather than saying i love this person many times you know but i do think that they've improved a lot on that and i do want to say this specifically for you chris uh Ooh. the one the the lawyer episode the one uh, where Ben ha is is the lawyer and Jen is the hologram. Yeah, Ben Song for the defense. Yeah, I really liked Jen in that episode. Nan Rissa is a force, and it just it still kind of galls me at this point in the series that everybody seems to have a niche, and you know Nan Rissa fits in very well, but I don't think they're using her enough. And I hope that improves over the next few episodes because she was great in the Princeton episode with the New Jersey Nazis. Yeah, yeah. I think she, like, she does a really good job as the hologram. I, yeah. I still don't know about the security job because I feel like it, it feels redundant and uh, adding more characters to the project doesn't really help to have people have bigger parts. But uh, I do think that there are parts where it's it's worked with her and I hope that they can kind of figure out a structure where she she has a uh, a role that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, and even if it's just to be the hologram more often, I yeah, you know, I, I like I, her as the hologram. I'd be, I'd be happy with that, and I do like the rapport that she has with Ian. So when they're together, and they've been pairing them a lot together this season, first with the evil chip plot, and now just coincidentally in the cave, as they call it, back at the project. I, d I did like their brief conversation in this one about like, did you have a guy? And I'm like, well, I wouldn't tell you about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like that works a little better when they kind of allude to her criminal past and use that to their advantage. Yeah. And I mean, poor Ian is still most times, uh, not most times, but most times is probably strong. But a lot of the time I'm still noticing that Ian's dialogue is to do a recap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I noticed that right away. They're like, we're coming from the season break. Remember when this happened and this happened? Let me tell you your story to you. What do you think? Look, if you thought that your boyfriend was going to propose to you, but instead he tells you that your missing ex-fiance may be returning, an ex-fiance who, mind you, might also be falling in love with another woman outside of the balance of time and space. How do you think you would feel? I know why they do it, but it's like, man, you, you don't. They had an opening recap already. They don't need Ian to also recap it in dialogue kind of clunkily. But yeah, but, you know. It was quantum, minimal. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely minimal. They have improved on that aspect of it on the show quite a bit. And um, yeah. it's just one of the last lingering vestiges, I guess, of the necessities of network television. Because you can't trust your audience to follow along. You got to spoon feed them every yeah, week. Some, and... Sometimes you do have to do that. And they, they did that on the old show, too. So All the sometimes time. it's necessary. All the time. Yeah. So, I mean, I, on the whole, though, am very happy with the way the project stuff has shaken out this season. And I think it's a direct result of Peter's involvement in the show, which is weird because, like you said, it's like, oh, we're introducing yet another character in Tom that's back at the project when we don't see much from the existing cast. But I feel like the introduction of Tom as a character has helped cement the back at the project stuff it gives it a center to work around that's not just the mystery box and he's used very sparingly but the way he is used is to i think bring addison's character to a different place and we'll talk about that but i just feel like 
it's a natural evolution of a three year gap between Ben being lost and then being back. It's like this dynamic that was built off screen that we didn't see, but it seems perfectly natural now. And they seem to be jiving as a group much more coherently. Yeah. And then we also have uh, Ian's partner as well uh, as a recurring. So it's there's a lot going on. Yeah, Um, I have some opinions on Tom, but before we get to that, I don't know if this ever came up. Mm-hmm. His name's Tom Westfall. Oh yeah! Oh, you didn't. We, we did a whole episode Tommy about Westfall? this. Yeah, we, we. Oh, go Is back and listen. Go Tommy back and Westf- listen to the premiere. <laughs> we're in the Westfall verse, are we? I think I we are. Know. We were in. The, I feel like Quantum Leap is, has been in the Tommy Westfall verse, probably because of Magnum PI or something. But <laughs> now we have the man himself, Tommy Westfall. Um, yeah. This brings up all sorts of questions. Yeah, Matt and I discussed this at like <laughs> Tommy. Westfall. Tommy Westfall is back. Interesting. It's spelled slightly differently, but is this going to be in a snow globe? I think so. <laughs> is it, I is think it, it might be. a quantum leap? We're going to pan out. We're in a snow We're globe. We're going to see. You're going to be. It's going to be a snow globe on the shelf in the back of the bar in Kochberg, Indiana. Was Howie Mandel even real? Come on. <laughs> Bruce McGill is just going to look at the snow globe and chuckle knowingly. <laughs> <laughs> I've always found coincidence amusing. And poor Sam a beer, because Sam is going to be the new stopper at Al's place. <laughs> oh my gosh. All sorts of things. Uh, yeah, Tom. Okay, so so Tom's character, see, I hadn't seen anything with him prior to quitting the podcast before, so I got caught up on him. Um, he, I feel like he does serve a function. Um Putting him in charge of the project, I feel like now what is Magic's function here? I feel like Magic has had some some strong episodes. I liked, uh, was it Night in Koreatown? One Night in Koreatown, yes. One Night in Koreatown. I thought that was a really strong episode for him. Even before uh, Tom was added to the cast, I feel like Magic sometimes gets just relegated to um, pep talk scenes with people. Mm. So I f- I'm trying to figure out, again, with him and Jen, you know, what's a, a good function and place for them in the project. Tom, uh, I liked him in the episode where he had to be the hologram because it added a new dynamic. And I think that's what I'm liking about them switching the holograms around sometimes is because the- there was a different kind of dynamic there. And I feel like Tom was showing a, a bit more of a human side to him in that episode. Like he's very straight laced. Sometimes could could verge into boring, but I think in that episode, uh, I like the dynamic. It was a little awkward, and this was their first meeting too. Um, but they still told us some of his story. Ben was connecting with him in some way, uh, so it didn't feel like it was just there to cause a pissing contest, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I had commented on that when we reviewed the episode, um, how much I liked the dynamic between Ben and Tom. Like, I feel like they could yeah. be friends under different circumstances, like like legit friends. So that was a, a good strength of the episode because I think a lot of a lot of shows might just, you know, go with that pissing contest just for the the false trauma of it all. Well, you're with my ex and oh, you're a threat to me, you know, you know, and they they didn't they didn't fall into that trap. Yeah, I think that's been nice about this uh quadrangle going on with uh with Ben and Addison and Tom and Hannah is that all of them understand each other in some way. Like it doesn't feel like people are just being petty. Like there is some jealousy or some resentment, but it doesn't feel like they're holding these things against anyone in particular. Yeah. And, you know, Dean spoke to that when we spoke to him earlier in the season. He said, look, these are adults. They're going to process their feelings pretty quickly and they're going to come to some kind of resolution or some kind of uh, way that they can move forward, like a dynamic that works because they have to. And I love that about this show. And I guess maybe because I'm conditioned by all the shitty CW shows where the melodrama is everything. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. looking at you, Flash. I'm looking at you, uh, Arrow. I'm looking at you, you know, just in certain. Maybe not Superman and Lois. That's a really good show. But um, I think that it's almost refreshing that we have adults dealing with each other like adults. And sometimes there's acrimony, but it doesn't define what's going on on screen, which is maybe the biggest blessing of all with this dynamic that they've set up. Because, again, they could have fallen into that trap, and they didn't. They, They made a concerted effort, if Dean is to be believed, to not do that, because what's what's the value in that? It feels like they that was what they went into it trying to accomplish, and it feels like they succeeded on that in that part. 
what, whatever uh, my phrasing here. <laughs> it seems like they succeeded. They succeeded in that part on that effort. They, in that part, in that effort, <laughs> with that thing, with the words. I like the thing in the words. Yeah, those are yeah. good words. You know, it was. You know, it was so funny. Um, I when Tom was introduced, first of all, another Tom, and I'm sure you guys went over that. But um, <laughs> I don't know. If everyone we did. was like. <laughs> There are, there's so many Toms in Quantum Leap. They it love to Toms. Be. It has to be. <laughs> they love Toms. Um, but it, when he was introduced and then everyone at the project's like, oh, that Tom, I love that Tom. Hey, Tom. Oh, my God. Tom looked at me. Tom, I love you, Tom. And that was so funny to me. Like, everyone was Tom's biggest fanboy. And he's, like, smiling with his perfect, handsome face. Like, hey, what's up? I'm Tom. <laughs> I don't know, it just really, it really got to me. And then everyone was like, Tom, Tommy boy. <laughs> you could turn that into a drinking game. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I just thought that was, that was really great. Everyone at the project's like, oh, Tom, you think Tom would sign my football? <laughs> Tom? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Matt and I discussed that and uh, I had my suspicions about Tom. I don't know if I still do, but he was just too goddamn perfect. You know, oh, it's, like, it's got to be something going on, on here. Sick. There's yeah. something going on. Yeah. I feel like it would be too easy if he was a bad guy, though, to be like, oh, well, I guess Addison doesn't have to marry him. You know, I don't know where they're going with that. I think that me thinking that does them a disservice because it kind of falls into the same trap as just making the relationship melodrama front and center. And they're not doing that either. Yeah. So. Well, I think what I mean, conflict can be good, too. But there's also like falling into certain tropes that are annoying. But yeah. Um, yeah. I think maybe what was going on there was they were trying to uh, go with what the, the character description in, during casting was. You know, men want to be him. Women want to be with him. They love him. You know, that kind of thing. Like, I think they were trying to tell you, like, he is well liked. This isn't going to be a big drama thing. But maybe it went a little too much in that other direction where it was like, OK, <laughs> we love you, Tom. But um, yeah, I, I don't know what they're doing with this character or what the plans are. Um, I think going forward, it would be nice to see a little bit more uh, of the humanizing moments where he's not so perfect. And and I don't know if he's meant to be exactly completely perfect all the time, but, you know, he's he's very reserved. So you don't get to see a lot of that. So that was what was nice about the uh, the one where he had to step in as the hologram. That was the, the Einstein one. Yeah, that was the one that really introduced Hannah as like Ben's potential love interest. That one. Right, yeah. Yeah. So even though we saw her in the UFO episode before the closure encounters. But I think that I'm happy where Tom is with this. And I see the role of Tom with the project not being redundant with magic because Tom has got his hand in other pies, his finger in other pies. Is that the expression? I feel like the Project Quantum Leap is just one thing that they've asked him to come and investigate because but he's running it now right like magic retired from that no what is no no i feel like magic is magic is like the day-to-day -day. he's like the he still is the boss like he's the administrator he's there is tom he? comes I, in i swore he like he retired during that period and, and no i don't tom think so i think he just his he role. just took no he took some time off to go dry out and maybe establish more of a relationship with beth but Tom is always going back and forth to Washington. Tom is coming from an oversight agency because the project is suddenly back online. And Tom is sort of pulling the strings to help keep it going so that they can maybe rescue Ben. And that doesn't mean that he's in charge of the day-to-day -day stuff. I feel like that's still Magic's job at the project. Okay. Yeah, Tom is just the overseer that has to now go talk to the suits in D.C. to get the funding, to get the approvals, to get to get the clearances to keep working on this project that's probably insanely expensive. So they, they have to justify their existence, and Tom is helping them do that. It's almost like the committee dynamic in the first the first and second season. Right. He's kind of the 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 between person, the, the right. between guy. He's got to go talk man. to Weitzman. That's the word. The between guy. The middleman. <laughs> Middle I'm going to get a t-shirt with Tom's face that says the between guy. Between get on guy. that, Scott Madison. He's the between guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to ask about, this is me um, perhaps missing some things or or uh, not paying as close attention. I want to ask about Tom's uh, revelation, I guess, that he, he has some way to get Ben back. He said that this is a, from an old DARPA program? Yes. What what is DARPA? DARPA is like the research arm of the federal government. As a matter of fact, hang on. I have I'm gonna I'm gonna go run to my library. I just bought a book on DARPA, and I can give you. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Hang on, hang on. Okay, I'm back. 
So you were so excited to whip out DARPA knowledge. You're like, oh <laughs> hell yeah, I got a book on this. I found this book in Vermont <laughs> in a bookstore, and it was on like the 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 five dollar shelf. I got it for like five bucks. It's called The Department of Mad Scientists: How DARPA is Remaking Our World from the Internet to Artificial Limbs, and DARPA stands mm. for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So it makes okay. sense that something like time travel would be of concern to DARPA or something that DARPA might try to dabble in. Um, if you want to okay. know more about like weird stuff and DARPA, you. You can also read the John Ronson book, The Men Who Stare at Goats. Uh, it was a movie with Ewan McGregor and George Clooney. It's a fantastic movie. It's a fantastic book. But they also talk about some of the more wackier aspects of DARPA and just how out there they can be in theorizing, well, what is possible? It sometimes gets metaphysical. Oh, okay. It's interesting. So I think DARPA is a perfect fit if you're going to dovetail Project Quantum Leap into an existing government Hierarchy? Yeah. DARPA makes as much sense as anything. Probably more sense than anything else. Is DARPA, um, or this program that DARPA was doing, is it supposed to be directly related to Quantum Leap? Or they were also looking at qu uh, time travel stuff and this may relate to, to getting Ben back? I don't know. Let's get Dean on the phone because yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, at least like it's something that's that was not clear or at yeah. least not not gone into yet. So it's not just me. No, no, it's not just you. Yeah, because I, I paused it to read it. Yeah, me too. To read the page. There were some typos in there, which was kind of funny. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I wasn't really sure what I was looking at. I was just like, maybe this will help. And it seemed to be like, you know, an RPG, like how to run your time travel program. <laughs> That program reminded me of my first foray into coding, like, and I say that with air quotes, because we got a Commodore 64 when we were kids, and you could hook it up to, like, the television in the living room, but we had no idea what to freaking do with it. So there was, like, this <laughs> code that you could put in, and it was, like, you know, like the C colon slash code. It was, like, real old-time coding. I don't even know what it's called, but the only thing we learned how to do was to put a thing where – this line would then propagate itself and just start scrolling up the screen. And it looked like coding like that. It looked like if this, then that. If not this, then that. It looked like really basic coding. I was searching it and scouring it for any kind of name, for any kind of connection to the original Project Quantum Leap. But <laughs> there did not appear to be uh, no. anything, anything at all. Even something that they wouldn't have noticed because they did make some allusions to Evil Leapers back in the first season. They they have, they did. you know. Okay, I was watching that when I was binging through and they have the scene. They're like, this thing was misfiled. And here's the <laughs> Evil Leapers exist. And I feel like that happened directly because of me. Because <laughs> I, I was asking about that, right? I was asking like... What do, don't they know? Like, if they have the specs to recreate the project, why wouldn't they have the files of, like, previous right. leaps and stuff? Like, 100%. why, why wouldn't yeah. that come up? So I think that's why they're like, this was misfiled. Yeah. Matt and I discussed that at length. It's just like, what do they know about the original project and why don't yeah. they seem to know as much as they should? Wouldn't they have everything at their disposal if they're rebuilding yeah, yeah. it from, from the ground up? Even if it's a different build, different programming, you would have to immerse yourself in what came before to build on right because if they yeah because if they have that then they would have the files about the leaps and stuff because i mean why would they hide certain parts of it but but not that i mean it'd be it'd be weird yeah it's, it's an odd question it's one that we have asked repeatedly so you're not alone in that thinking Allison. okay maybe it's because of you maybe you guys drove the point home i don't know but i was like okay that's fine like one line about that was fine you know yeah yeah, it was fine. It was fine. But, you know, so so for all that, I was looking for something that maybe because their knowledge of the original project seems to be sketchy at best. So what yeah. do we know that they don't that we have noticed on that screen and the Internet just broke um, that would have gone over their head? Oh, nothing. There's nothing. nothing. On it. No, it was like <laughs> type in welcome to the time travel project. <laughs> oh, no, the snakes <laughs> have killed your your bison. <laughs> I don't understand that reference at all. Uh, Oregon Trail. <laughs> you have dysentery or whatever. I don't know. I don't remember all the lines from Oregon Trail. But, you know. What is, what is Oregon Trail? It's an old computer game. Oh, where you'd okay. Like, you know, you'd have to, like, uh, you know, um, get all your supplies and all your uh, livestock and all this stuff. And then frequently, you know, you would die of thirst or snakes <laughs> bite you or whatever. And then you'd die and you'd have to start over. And you're like, ah, son of a... 
Oh, I act wow. like I've played this. I've only like I I think my brothers might have played it. I don't think I ever played it myself, but I like making jokes about it. <laughs> anyway, it just reminded me of one of those old computer games, you know, because it would be like, "Thank you for trying out time travel" or whatever. Like, if you guys pause it, that's what it says, unless they yeah, yeah. change it before air. But <laughs> yeah, it could be. Maybe there'll be something that's on on the aired version that's not on the screener. But I have a feeling this is pretty much locked down. So. Yeah, yeah, it did. It, there was like a typo that I at least one typo I noticed because they like uh, forgot the first letter of a word or something. But oh, you won't yeah. notice it. It goes by quick. And no, I thought that that was a typo too. But it's actually they're showing that screen on an angle and it's being blocked by another screen. Oh, so that's why. Well, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, so I how didn't dare realize. you? <laughs> I, <laughs> that thing I that was that a, wrong. a microsecond. I thought, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just one of those things. I love doing this in anything I watch. Like pause. Like, haha, what's on the screen that we're not supposed to read because it goes by too quick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I thought the maybe you saw the typo that they spelled Beckett with one T, but I guess not. They didn't have Beckett in there. I, right? I know talk. that was that was my idea of a joke. I mean, you oh, had your Oregon Trail joke. At least I my was joke like, was did germane. I don't, yeah. That'd feel like a more direct <laughs> reference, but no. <laughs> Anyway, so we got, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of a dry hole there. Um, I was expecting a little bit more from the revelation because that's what's brought us out of the first half of the season. I thought that we would really right. pick up in a more substantive way on that. But I guess they're playing it close to the best for now. Yeah, it just feels like here's our, our mid-season cliffhanger anyway. <laughs> But I mean, it's it's building into something, which is fine, because like like I said, um, I don't mind when, it, you know, it feels like the story is moving forward. It doesn't have to always out epic, out important itself, you know, as long as it seems like it's it's going somewhere and not just, you know, circling the drain, which it's not because they're you know trying to figure out what all this means. It's it's evocative of how they played the evil chip stuff earlier in the season. It didn't become about that. That was just occasionally something that we went back to the project for. But it was interspersed with a lot more interesting stuff, and therefore it was a lot more palatable. Because um, I guess you haven't listened to the episodes that Matt and I did for the first half of the season. That was an aspect of the first few episodes of the season that, that kind of annoyed me. And... I find this much more intriguing. Uh, uh, talking about what? The the evil chip. The the we call it evil chip. The chip that the evil chip. The chip that Ian had commissioned oh, to find right, Ben, yeah. and then they right. were siphoning the information away right. from the chip. Is that chip. going somewhere now, or is it done? Well, I mean, Jen and Ian put the kibosh on Simone Evil Chip. That's what we named her, the lady in the back of the limo. Right. But we right. don't know who her boss is, and this is a perfect segue, oh. Allison. I see. Jeffrey. Jeffrey the genius. Jeffrey. Oh, you think you think Jeffrey's going to be your boss? I think Jeffrey's going to be Lothos. I think that I oh think Oh my god. I think Jeffrey I think no, number one Jeffrey, do you think Jeffrey don't do this to let's, us. Let's break it down. Do you think Jeffrey is Ben's son? No. All right, cuz the well, timing I mean like he doesn't I mean okay, he doesn't really look well, okay. The way that it works in um I was going to say he doesn't really seem biracial, but I guess like in this uh, case, he's in other people's bodies. So he can't be Ben's son because it's not Ben's body. But do we know how because Ben is there somehow, too? I mean, this is a big question. Oh, so he's like, it's like y y they had sex in the TARDIS and it's a Time Lord uh, human baby or whatever. Because <laughs> time know. stuff. Maybe. Or maybe Ben is Ben is there in some capacity bodily and and mentally like he is all there. Because there's no one back at the project. So I, I think that it's plausible that even though he's coexisting quantumly entangled with his host in some way and they're existing in the same space at the same time, his DNA could come through as much as the – I guess who was the agent, um, the, the international man of mystery in Cairo that he leapt into? Allison. Michael Allison was the, the leapy in that. So – could this be Ben's son or could this be a product of the union of Ben and Hannah, no matter what the DNA is? Did Ben and Hannah get together? Am I forgetting? Oh, like yeah, they them? got yeah, they got jiggy with it in Cairo. Okay. And they even okay. talked about they even <laughs> talked about right before, you know, they banged how they would turn off the screens back at HQ when things oh, settled okay. down. I guess. And right. that was my yeah, my biggest thing to the lore on that episode is they turn off the screen when Ben wants to fuck or poo. <laughs> they got to give him some privacy. Exactly. Exactly. Does Ben know that they're always like everything that they see? 
Because it seems like he's talking about things that, you know, if he knew that they were always listening or Addison was watching, maybe he wouldn't be so open about. And I feel like maybe he would temper himself given other circumstances. But what's his choice? His choice is to not live his life fully or just accept that people are going to be listening and that's just part of it. And hey, at least if if I do something that upsets them, at least they'll be upset for the right reasons. That's always been my my rationale for acting like an asshole. Like, hey, at least I'm being honest about it. And if you're going to hate me for it, at least you hate me for something I believe in or for the right reasons. I think maybe Ben is gotten to that hey if you guys are gonna watch me bang then all right there's nothing i can do about it but it's not gonna stop me from banging so <laughs> it's a great example isn't it <laughs> <laughs> i mean this thing with with jeffrey if uh, i feel like if they made him ben's son it would feel a little too much like sammy joe too like i was joking you know like but i i don't think that needs to be a thing again i don't mind them doing the like um the lovers across time with Hannah, I feel like that was handled a lot better than trilogy because there there's consent there. Like it's, it's not the weirdness of like her not knowing who she's with. She knows that it's Ben. So it doesn't feel like this, this weird violation, but I don't really think we need to bring a kid of Ben's into it. I don't know. It just feels like a little too evocative of that. And I don't like super special kid across time plots anyway. I don't know. Uh, I know. I don't know. (laughs) Well, you know, the other thing that and maybe because, again, I'm primed to look for this stuff because I have my own little pet theories. But the second that Kevin sees Jeffrey, he says, this kid's going to run the world someday. And I was like, "Ooh, foreshadowing. (laughs) Well, I don't know if they would do. I don't think it's going to be like Lothos, but maybe some similar thing with the pro. I could see him maybe being like head of the the people with the chip or something. Like an antagonist. And he would be older than Ben at this point. He'd be in his 60s, I guess, because if he was born in... And that's why I'm saying the timing works out because they were in Egypt in in 52. I wrote this down. Let me look at, let me look at my timeline, my extensive timeline. They <laughs> were have, like the, yeah. the pictures on the wall and the strings connecting them. Somebody has to at least try to do what Matt always did for us. So, yeah. Okay. So the kid, so the kid That's is seven the, years old. That was old. my big thing. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to pay, like pay yeah. as close attention. Like he would know this stuff. You he know? would. Yeah. He would Matt appear. Would he, he, he would, would already be like, I've like, figured on a timeline. out the timelines. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so Ben was in Egypt in 1961. They had sex sometime in 1961 in Egypt. Uh, The kid is seven years old. It is now 1970. So say, you know, 61 went into 62 and the kid could have a birthday later in the year. It's conceivably it could be Ben's son. The problem is, like, why wouldn't she say this is your son? Like, she would have to know if it is Ben's son. Hannah would have to know unless she met Josh like two weeks later and they got married like overnight and it, I, I can't see her holding back that fact from Ben. Yeah, she seemed pretty upset when she thought he wasn't going to tell her that it was him at first, too. So it feels like she would be pretty open about that. But again, the timeline then demands that she just saw Ben in Cairo. She's waiting to see him again. And then within months, within a year at least, she meets Josh, marries him and has a son. So what's going on there? It's like... what You said what it was 61? Yeah, so it's 61 and now it's 1970. So we're talking about well, nine years. A, a nine-year difference. But the kid, is, the, kid is, later. the kid is seven, maybe turning eight. So it's really only like, it, like within a year, a year and a half. Yeah, I mean, I guess like, you know, if there was like a nine-month difference and it went into 62 and he had a later birthday, like you said, but I don't know. I feel like that's stretching it. I guess we'll see like how it plays out, but I don't know if I go, if if I buy that that's where they're going with it. Yeah, I, I just feel like it's conceivable. I, no pun intended. Yeah. And I guess what I said earlier when I was like, oh, he doesn't look biracial, I guess that seems like insensitive because like, you know, there are people who don't look exactly like that, even if they are, so... I mean, he could be, or it could be, you know, weird quantum entanglement. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I have no he, idea. Might, he might have triple DNA. You know? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a new triple DNA child. <laughs> We've never seen the likes of which... He can time travel without an accelerator. Ooh. He inherited his parents' smarts. Yeah. <laughs> Super genius boy. 
<laughs> he's so, got the BB gun. Uh, he's got the BB gun, the Red Rider. Uh, homage to a Christmas story, for sure. You'll shoot your eye out, Red Rider. Yeah, yeah, that out. felt yeah. a little bit. I was thinking of that. It was a little forced, but uh, it was Chekhov's BB gun. They used it again in the final act. Right, yeah. I think they were just, you know, setting it in the time and then they were they were doing the payoff there, which they did with quite a few things. Like, uh, I liked how they set up with Kevin that he's a fast talker. And then later when they're like, we need someone to make a distraction here, they're like, oh, perfect. Send Kevin out because Kevin knows how to like talk forever. I, I like that. And I like the fact that Kevin brought, um, much like Jane's character in A Hunting Move Go, like whenever things veered a little too close to melodrama he would make like puke sounds especially when they were talking oh, about yeah. the relationship she's an amazing person she deserves to have someone who's there for her really there for her <laughs> that was the funniest thing <laughs> uh, i did laugh too and he's like and then a little smile on your face and you're like <laughs> That was some much needed levity. I think some it it worked really well because it's it's nice when there's someone who's kind of a foil to Ben, even if they're not directly comedic like this. It's nice when there is a little more of a of a foil to him. That's why I liked Jen as the hologram because I felt like there was kind of a sense of humor there. She had a different approach to things. That was a nice dynamic. The same with Magic. You know, he had a different kind of approach to it than Ben. Yeah, and Ian too in the bank. In the heist. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I feel like, you know, it was nice when they had the different dynamics because everyone brought their own style to it. And it was nice to have a, a nice foil to him, even with Tom. Like, there was a good friction there that made you go like, ooh, what are they going to do next when they interact? Yeah, I, I'd hate to see this dynamic where they set them up to be potential friends and then not capitalize on that in some way because it worked so well, so unexpectedly well in the episode. What if Tom was Ben's son. Da, da, da. That was my other line of reason. Is Tom Do you really somehow... think that? No, I don't think it. Here's the thing. My head is exploding with how are they going to try to pull the rug out from under us? So I'm trying to anticipate any twists. He's his grandson. Yeah, he's his own grandfather. <laughs> and that's why Addison was so drawn to him because she... <laughs> right. I don't... Yeah. I, yeah, he would have to be a grandson. Maybe he's uh, Jeffrey's son. Yeah. Maybe it goes Ben, Jeffrey, Tom. Yeah, maybe. Because Jeffrey would be like in his 60s at this point. So I feel like they'd have to say like Tom didn't know much about his history, though, because he would have to know he was related to Hannah if that was a thing they were doing. That's where it would fall apart for me. You know, the second he saw Hannah, he would be like grandma or mom, you know, so I, I don't think that that's going to happen. What if they said Hannah had a kid with Ben and then gave the kid up and that led to Tom? Maybe. I mean, Hannah's going to play into at least two or three more episodes, so that could be a thing. I know she's at least in the, the finale, because I think Eliza Taylor uh, was uh, posting on Instagram about wrapping up on the season with them. So, And I, I can't imagine why she wouldn't be in the finale anyway, because that is the overarching plot. But the fact of the matter is, the kid is already like seven, so it would have to be Jeffrey giving up his son so that Tom wouldn't know. Yeah, well, that's assuming Jeffrey is part of the line. There could be another line that they don't know about. Ooh, all right. <laughs> this is all very confusing. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, I mean, we could we could speculate on on this all day. This is a rabbit hole I really wanted to go down. So, uh, you know, it just it's nice to spitball these ideas with you, Allison Pregler. But uh, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's interesting. But I would be surprised if any of this stuff came to fruition the way I'm thinking of it. I know that there's something bigger going on, but I'm almost glad that I'm not figuring it out because I I want to yeah. be surprised and, and impressed in everything. I don't want to go and say, yep, called it. It's really nice to not know where the story's going and also feel like it is still moving forward in some way. Because last season, that was really what bothered me about the overarching plot with like why Ben leaped, because a lot of the time it was just them saying, but why? Or Janice going, well, I can't tell you anything. And it wasn't really moving forward. It was just kind of stopping the story. And here they've intertwined it with Ben's story. So it doesn't feel like they're separate shows. And it doesn't feel like, you know, we're just discussing it just to move the story along for like, you know, however many episodes the season. It feels like there's a purpose to everything. Mm. Now that you put it in those terms, maybe that's why Ben leapt instead of talking to Hannah in that moment. 
if he has a purpose and he is leaping himself and there's a bigger story at play, maybe he subconsciously is putting himself into a place where he can better warn her about the loss. I don't know. I feel like I feel like Josh is a goner. I oh. feel like he ain't he ain't saving Josh. I feel Josh. like he's gonna be gone next time the that he sees Hannah and Do you think? But now Hannah has a yeah. I don't think Josh is getting saved, but I, I think it was nice that Ben wanted to save him. You know, he's such a selfless character that he's like, even though this would make it easy for him to be able to step in, you know, he wants to save him because he saved him too. Like, you know, Josh helped him out, but also because he cares about Hannah and about her happiness. I guess maybe that that kind of dovetails with one other thing that we got, which is to me evocative of the classic series, because Kevin tells Ben, "You like her, you love her." I think so. Well, then how complicated can it be? Look, you only have so many shots at happiness in this life. You got to look out for number one. That sounds an awful lot like who? Hmm. Do you get one chance at true love? See bright anyone? Oh, yeah, yeah. People don't jump off a ship for unrequited love. No, but for, for true love. True love? Yeah. I mean, it only happens once in a lifetime, and, and you have to be lucky. Sam, if you're lucky, life is going to give you one shot at true love. That, to me, just jumped out like gangbusters. Sam heard the exact same thing from Al in Seabright and M.I.A., so again, this to me is like a big touchstone where I think that the writer is deliberately seeding some of these ideas in. But it, it, it also works again in the context of the story that we're seeing now where Ben is realizing that, okay, maybe even if Hannah can't be with him because she's married, this might be her one true chance for real happiness with someone who will be there. That's a theme that he brings yeah. up earlier in the episode before Kevin barfs all over it. He said she deserves someone who's really there for her. Yeah. Maybe he feels that way for Hannah, too, because for him, it's been a day. For her, it's been nine years. So, right. yeah. He's, yeah, he's trying to be selfless. Like, maybe he's thinking this could be her one true shot. Let me go save this guy. Yeah, and it um it didn't escape me that uh, the dialogue Hannah has about loving two people at once equally applies to Addison and Tom as well. Do you think it's possible to love two people at the same time? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I do. There is no limit to love. Addison loves Ben and Tom, you know, and it just felt like they weren't saying that uh, anyone was letting someone else down because they loved someone else too. Yeah, yeah. Hannah's just a free love hippie. It's she, 1970. <laughs> polygamy. She, you know what? Polygamy only works if you have everyone's consent. You gotta let your husband know. You can't. Yeah. Mm, can't have it both ways. But. You can't be polyamorous on the side. <laughs> yeah, then that's just cheating. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you realize that, Hannah. Hannah. But, you know, you know, she she knew he was going to be gone soon anyway. It was can't be forever. Sounds an awful lot like justification, Hannah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's a very interesting take. I thought that was a nice scene between the two of them. And it also almost led into that kiss. Uh, I wonder why they hesitated on the kiss, why they, why they pulled that punch. Because it would have been nice to see them kiss. No, it's because she's married and it's, it's different now, you know? Yeah, no, I it understand. It does change things. Even if you love two people, you know, like it's still a different circumstance. But Ben was down for it. Oh, he was down for it, but he was conflicted, but... She talked him into it. He's like, here, Hannah, twist my arm. Okay, I'll kiss you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was also thinking, too, uh, through this episode, Kevin can F himself. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the show, but I understood that reference. <laughs> it's a good show. Uh, Raymond Lee was great in it, and uh, yeah, I thought that was... I, I'm sure that wasn't a reference naming him Kevin, but, you know, I kind of thought of it because he is a a slimy character, but not too slimy. You know, he does save Ben when he could just leave him to die. So they show, like, you know, they plant little seeds that he's not a completely heartless person. And, ooh, I really did like the car chase. I liked the music that they chose for it. I liked it had a slight comedic slant. I like that when the car flipped, uh, there was a little more consequences than when that truck flipped and that... That episode uh, in the 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 kid camp or whatever, when the car flips and they're all fine two seconds later. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of them broke her leg, but other than that. Did one of them break their leg? Man, I'm not remembering anything. Yeah, she was hobbling around. 
She also had the convenient uncle that lived in the area, kind of like Kevin's brother. Right. <laughs> it just happens to be where they jump off a bus in the middle of nowhere, but uh, because show. Or because right. GTFW. They did have like a little bit of recovery time. Um, also, like, what was going on with Ben's shoulder? Like, he was bleeding, but like, how is he bleeding from his shoulder? He like dislocated it. He dislocated it first when the car crash happened because they ripped him out of the car. Right. And then I guess when he hit the ground, the impact, maybe it was like an impact contusion. I don't know. Oh, yeah, I guess that could. Because he, be he said, thing. oh, what's the, what's the odds of you falling on the same shoulder? Well, I mean, I guess pretty good because I just jumped out of a moving bus. What are the odds of me being able to get up at all from jumping out of the back of a moving bus? Probably not too good, but, you know, let's just roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, And plus, he was handcuffed to this guy. So it's a good thing right. they didn't, you know, tumble in different directions. They both could have gotten broken arms and shoulder contusions. Right. Yeah, I guess like that he could have gotten much more injured than that. I was just trying to figure out why he was bleeding, but uh, I could see why in an impact that's what it maybe what could happen. Or maybe he cut it on the glass on the way out. Right. Maybe there were some shards. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I thought. Uh. I was like, did he get? Maybe, like, one of the bullets clipped him during the fight, because I thought he said something about that, but, like, listening back to it the second time around, I was like, oh, okay, he's saying, like, he's saying some other lines, but they were shouting a lot during the, the chase scene, where I was like, what are they saying? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, I had to watch that <laughs> they one had to twice. throw some stuff yeah. out there, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, there's too much dust, I can't see. Well, that means he no, can't see huh? either. <laughs> so, just like, okay, I guess that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, sometimes they got to kind of throw in the lines and like, you know, you, it's got to be really quick to keep up with the pace of the scene. I thought it was um really funny during the uh, the pep talk with uh, Magic and Addison. They have to get through it very quickly because they got other stuff to do in the episode, but they have to have the feeling scene in every episode so they're like let's chat it out and then at the very end when she's like uh, he says help isn't a four-letter word and she says well it is they adr in a line where he's like you deserve to be happy before they can like cut <laughs> cut to the next thing <laughs> i don't know if they added that because they were like we need more of a conclusion to this but i felt like it would have been better if it was just she says well it is a four-letter word and then that reaction that ernie hudson has where he's just laughing at it like it was just kind of a nice moment I don't feel it was really necessary to like add the like, you just have to be happy <laughs> before we get to the next part. <laughs> well, but it was still a nice scene. Addison's working through some stuff. I, I get that it was it was necessary. Yeah, she definitely is. And again, having like an adult nod to it, not her saying, I love Ben, but I love Tom. But uh, uh, just saying this is weird and screwed up. And he's just saying, you know what? Go to the person that you're with right now and handle it and be open about it. And I think that that's a good way to go. And I like the fact that she said yes to Tom when he proposed. I don't know that she's doing it for the right reasons. I think maybe she just wants to have a definitive direction to go in. Even if Ben gets home, they're not going to get back together. Tom is here for her now. You get that one shot. Yeah. You know, maybe she's getting maybe a couple. This is her second shot. Maybe she doesn't want to squander it. But is that for the right reason? So I have some questions about that. I think also she's following the advice of taking care of yourself sometimes. You know, Ben has some lines about that, like maybe he can exercise some radical selfishness yeah. um, himself. Um, so maybe she's like, I deserve to take care of myself, you know, and especially because Ben has these feelings for Hannah, like maybe she's allowed to move forward with her life too. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good place. And uh, I think that's a good place to, to leave it. Do you have any other observations that we haven't covered about Off the Cuff? No, I think that's it. All right. So why don't we do some final thoughts? Allison Pregler. Hey, I haven't asked you this in a while. What are your final thoughts <laughs> on Off the Cuff? It was a good episode. I liked the balance of comedy and serious stuff. And I thought that it moved forward very breezily. And I'm interested to see where things go. I agree with you 100%. It was an episode that, like you said, sometimes you have the highs, sometimes you have the dips, and we're in sort of a dip, but it's not in a bad way. It's setting stuff up for, I think, future storylines while giving us some really good character work and a great guest cast. I liked just about everything about it. I have some quibbles. I have some questions, but they're mainly goofs. And uh, I think that's a great place to be. So I think that closes the book on our discussion of Off the Cuff. But don't go anywhere because after the break, we will bring you our interview with David Clayton Rogers. Stay tuned. 
The QLP is brought to you by listeners like you. Please go to patreon.com slash quantum leap podcast and give as much as you can. For as little as a dollar a month, you can be a contributor to the Quantum Leap podcast. It goes to covering our server cost and helps keep the podcast going. Thank you. I'm Jethro. And I'm Matt. And we're the co-hosts of the Drunkard's Walk podcast. Do you know what the St. Pancras Railway Station, Hydrox Cookies, and the Ragamuffin Cat all have in common? They're all pages on Wikipedia. And on Drunkard's Walk, we go from one random Wikipedia page to another only through the internal links of Wikipedia. That's right. And we get those destination pages from guests that come on the show that we talk to and find out why they give us those pages. And there's a little drinking and a lot of arguing. So check out Drunkard's Walk wherever you find your podcasts. This is Joe Menendez, and you're listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. Hey, Allison, you know what? I I completely forgot to tell you. This is a funny thing, and it's not about radios. Oh? You had mentioned the car chase. So Ben is in a 65 Mustang. That was when I was growing up. I'm not a car guy. Like, I know nothing about cars. I I drive the same (laughs) car for like 10 years. But I always wanted a 65 Mustang when I was in high school. Oh, yeah? So he's driving around, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Look, it's it's the red. It's, I think, sweet. It it wasn't a convertible, but it wasn't a fastback either. It was just like a regular 65 Mustang, not a convertible. So he's driving around that. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. So, you know, cowboy hat guy, the killer, the the, the gun-toting guy. He comes up to them. And he's driving a Chevelle SS. My brother had that Chevelle. He had that car. So what nice. are the odds? So Ben is driving <laughs> my you know, adolescent dream car. And the bad guy is driving my brother's adolescent dream car, which he actually bought and fixed up himself. So they were writing that for me is what I'm telling you. Yeah, bringing yeah. the DeFilippis <laughs> brothers together. And the fact Sweet. that both cars get destroyed shortly thereafter, I don't know if that's some kind of poetic thing. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to explore that too deeply, but <laughs> <laughs> it was nice to see both of the uh, both of the cars that had some kind of personal meaning to me because I don't care about cars. So if you know if you're going to do it, they did it right. I know less about cars than you, but they look pretty cool. <laughs> and I'm glad that everybody walked away from those horrific accidents. So. <laughs> Dust it off. There we go. So, hey, didn't I tell you that we had an interview? Hey, we have an interview. Hey. Hey. So, uh, yeah, Albie and I got to speak to the main guest star of this episode, David Clayton Rogers. And without further ado, here it is. Hello, Leapers, and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie, and uh, with me today is Chris. And we are very fortunate to have, he played Kevin Zat in the ninth episode of season two of Quantum Leap, Off the Cuff. He is David Clayton Rogers. How you doing, David? I'm very fortunate to be here. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it with you guys. I, I have seen a ton of the original series and I've watched all of season one. I'm kind of waiting to binge season two, um, but I, I don't know. <laughs> if a guest star spends more time with, you know, with the leaper than a guy who's handcuffed to him. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, that's got to be some kind of record. I think you were with him in every scene pretty much. Yeah. And then and in breaks, too, you know, between scenes, too, where the, you know, props would be like, do you guys want to take the handcuffs off? And I was like, no, Ray's awesome. I'm good. Ray was like, hey, take it off. we can take it off. <laughs> it's, yeah, we can, David, it's okay. We can take a break. We don't need to wear it all the time. Uh, Joe, the director, was talking about uh, different pairs of handcuffs and different types and bruises. And what was that like just being handcuffed for what, seven days, eight days? Yeah, it was eight days. And, you know, and you jump right into it. It's It's a, it's a funny thing being a guest star where you come in and, brand new and you're so excited to be there but you also know that someone else was there the day before and was like the new best friend and you know it's it's a weird and then at the end of eight days if you're fortunate to be there for every day of production you're gone um it's it's a weird thing but also i know that for this show in particular ray has sort of the same experience a flip side version of it the same experience with these new actors coming in all the time but yeah, there's there's nothing like being physically changed to somebody within, 
you know, seven minutes of meeting them to like really force a bond. It's funny because it's it's keeping up a grand quantum leap tradition from the classic series. I think there are two episodes where Sam spends the entire episode uh, cuffed to somebody, or for the majority oh, really? anyway. I'm think well, there's one called Unchained where he's on a chain gang. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there's, there's an episode called uh, "Hunting We Will Go," which this episode reminded me so much of a "Hunting We Will Go," and he's he's a bounty hunter, and he's oh. got uh, he's handcuffed to Jane Sibbett the entire episode or most of the episode. Oh great! So, I don't remember. It's that. a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's a it's a weird thing when you come into a show and sometimes it's like you know there's a romance scene right off right from the get go, but this was the first time that I've come into a show and just you know been handcuffed to somebody the entire time <laughs> and they had yes they did have different versions there's a handcuff with some mole skin on the inside there's a handcuff that opens on its own but for the most part ray was like oh, the real ones just work better right I was like, sure yeah okay sure. <laughs> <laughs> let's do this um, with the real handcuffs on yeah great good idea <laughs> I, I have to say your your comic timing and, and delivery of your lines in this episode were outstanding. Did you get started as a comedian or just comic acting improv? Uh, how did you get started in the business? I um, I did. I, I I had one of those high school experiences that seems to not really exist in real life, where like I played sports and then I did theater as well, and in the spring. I'd go do a play and be like, oh, we need some like big guys to play the guards in this Shakespearean piece. Let me go get the linemen from the football team. Um, and so it was sort of like a, it was a good melting pot. And it and it was um, the sort of setup where, of course, you had to audition for things. But if you wanted to participate, you could participate. Um, and so I, I brought some people over to the theater because of that. And I think I started doing theater in the first place just because. Um, I'd always enjoyed a drama class. Oh, also I, I did track one year in the spring. I was like, I'm slow. Um, <laughs> so I need something else to do next year. So auditioned for a play and just loved it. And then as life went on, just, you know, more and more of that went to college, um, did a ton of theater in college and then moved to New York and was doing some really awful East village theater within like a month of landing there. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how, yeah, so it, it just sort of, it, it progressed naturally. Just, I've, I've just, I've always loved it. TV roles and movie roles. How did, how does that go from uh, one to the other? Um, I think you get a lot of one and then it goes to the other. So I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I did at theaters, the love, um, because you get to really play out a scene and 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 you and there's like a danger to it and you um even if you're doing a a play even if you're doing 60 productions of something it's still a little different hopefully a little different every single time you do it um and so i was in new york doing this theater and sometimes it was good and sometimes it led to the breaking up of a theater company um it was a you know sometimes there are eight people on stage and four in the audience and maybe one guy (laughs) lived in this theater. Um, But eventually I moved to LA to try and make money so I could pay for theater basically. Um, And I, I landed and, and kept getting, um, I, I had some good dramatic roles, but, but a lot of the auditions were always for like the young JFK junior type or something. Um, and there's something internally that's just a little too squirrely for that character. Um, and so like I would land in between parts where I would get the, a part similar to the part on quantum leap where, you know, it's like he can't stop talking. He's smart, he's comedic, but he also has like a deep heartfelt something going on. And those were the ones that like kept popping up you know, be it in a Hallmark movie that was trying to push the envelope and be a little more serious Mm -hmm. um, or be it in, you know, something like this quantum leap episode. So it's, there's, there's not been like a straight um, comedy or drama trajectory. It's more like the through line has been this kind of character, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, yeah, I was thinking of every other holiday when I was talking about the movies. Uh, that was a good one. I, I like those kind of no way you watched that like on Hallmark your own. style movies. That was like I try to binge holiday movies around the holiday. That's good. Well, and there's there. I I shouldn't have said that. There's you. There's <laughs> a whole cadre of people who are like, yeah, I watched that movie. I watch it like four times every <laughs> yeah. Christmas. But exactly. that was they one have... where it was like, yeah, it was a Hallmark movie, but it was a little off kilter. Or it, or it was trying to be a Hallmark movie, but it was, um, but everyone involved was like, what if we made it like good? Um, <laughs> and that's nothing against Hallmark movies that I would love to be in that like food chain. It's fantastic. But from the DP to the director, to the writer, to everyone working on it, they're like, what if it just had a little more edge? You know, what if it was, and I think, you know, my getting cast is also that like, there's something. I say squirrely. Other people have had kinder words for it, but um, you know, it's sort of it's where I get to play a little bit of the bad guy. Um, but yeah, every other holiday was a blast. The number two at my son's school, and I live in LA. Um, there are plenty of celebs going through all of the schools, and the number two at my son's school after we've been there for about a month pulled me aside and she was like i never do this but you're absolutely one of my favorite actors and i was like it's that one episode of gilmore girls right and she's like no i didn't actually watch that but every other holiday um and uh yeah she's like it, it's literally my favorite movie so that, that's great it's, i've had a journeyman career but you, you i've landed in some moments that have been really really gratifying the, those Hallmark type movies, it's a whole genre and a whole feeling. So around that time of the year, it's just great to have them on. And, um, there, you know, there's even a cruise of people that go every year off, uh, not even on Christmas, just that love the Hallmark style Christmas movies, you know? It's really? Big it. Yeah. It's kind of almost like sci-fi fans, almost, you know, that many people like it. Yeah. So it's yeah. good work. It's good work. Yeah. So I could, I could see uh, somebody stopping you and saying that. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, but even then, it's sort of we're the fringe Hallmark movie a little bit. <laughs> I do love Gilmore Girls, though. I gotta admit. That's that was great. that's and that's been a fun one that I did an episode of Gilmore Girls, I don't know, 20 plus years ago. Um, yeah. And That'd I'll be, be in the most random place, and somebody would be like, You look like this guy who took Rory on a date. Like, <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> And that was your job. That's a great job to have. Oh, it's great. And that was one where like, yeah, she was awesome. I, I loved working with her. She was so cool and so cute and so smart. And so like, that's one of those where like, I'm in an episode and I'm really just at dinner with her getting to hang out and try and make her laugh, which was like, this, what a great job this is. Also, I applied to Yale and I did not get in. And so they had rebuilt. Um, the Yale campus and they'd rebuilt some, some rooms like mm -hmm. to spec. So I actually got to, you know, I got to go to Yale for a week, which was great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's a great show. If you haven't watched it, Chris, that's worth a binge. I, I have not. So I'm it, going to put it, it on my list, good. but I'm going to put David's episode on first, even if oh, it yeah, spoils absolutely. previous seasons. I, I don't think David, you're, yeah, you're I worth I it. Think you can jump in there <laughs> anywhere. It's yeah. a, it's yeah. a pretty rabid fan base. I mean, similar yeah. to, I want to, I want to turn a little bit to, the quantum world i i mean i've heard people say rabid fan base but that feels like it applies to a show like gilmore girls or something quantum leap i feel like is just uh there's something about the show that like rabid doesn't feel right more like dedicated fan base or like hmm. deep fan or like heartfelt fan base or something mm -hmm. like that i loved it so much like so so much um and so when it got rebooted, it was one of the one of the rare times where something gets gets another go or gets reimagined. And I'm not like, do we not have any original ideas? <laughs> that was one. I didn't know it was happening. And I drove by and saw, you know, Ray jumping on a bus stop. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. So what was the feeling like when you got when you got the, the part on Quantum Leap to actually be on the show? It was great. I, uh, it was one of the rare instances where it was an offer and that just, that just feels good regardless. Um, 
you know, if someone's like, I have a, a one day offer for you to take out my trash because we're out of town. I'm like, totally. I don't have to audition for it. Mm -hmm. um, but so it was that that's great. I had auditioned for it previously and I'd wor worked with Martin previously on Blindspot. Um, and so after the strike, um, I had auditioned for the pilot for the space pilot, um, shuttle pilot. And then after the strike uh, ended, it was just like, all right, it's firing back up. Let's hope something happens. And got like a weekend phone call of like, hey, you want to do Quantum Leap? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, and then they started to tell me about the part. It's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I live like eight minutes away from the studio. Like, dude, I need, I can come do a fitting right now. My manager was like, it's sun, it's 11 a.m. on a Sunday. I was like, I, <laughs> still, you know, I'm in, I'm in. Um, yeah, so I was, I was super delighted. I, a fun, a really fun thing as a fan of the show, um, I think was, well, there are a lot of things uh, seeing, um, seeing Ray in it that to who's going to replace Scott is like, uh, that's a, a mega feat. And you just have to have somebody who is so likable and so talented and can really like an actor inside an actor. Um, and so that was a really fun thing to see, like from watching the pilot to see like, oh, I think they got the guy. I think they got the right guy because I would love for it just to pick up with, you know, where's Sam now? Um, but obviously they didn't do that. So in reimagining it, who's gonna be your new leaper? And you've got to find somebody that has that same or a similar sense of likability. And I, and I think that Ray has that. Um, and then I also think I, I'm just, I'm just talking here. I, there was a question, you know, nine minutes ago, but I, um, <laughs> no, we love for, it. Anyone who, for anyone who's listening, I had some technical difficulty signing on both kids came in at one point I'm in the garage. Um, I'm using the hotspot for my phone. Uh, so really, I'm going to talk until these guys cut me off. Um, <laughs> we've done yeah, five hour podcasts I, I, before, just so you know. Yeah. You Albie is just like, we, we've done five hour podcasts before. Albie is just like challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, so in that case, I'm going to talk until my wife comes in. It's like, are you still on this? <laughs> uh, but it, another thing that I really love about the, the, the new the sequel version of it is um that you have the episodic a leap each episode or sort of um you know special episodes accepted um but then also you have that like i i say that martin thing just because i saw some of it on blind spot as well but like the larger puzzle serialization um is a lot of fun too um and that for me, at least, I, I imagine there's some people who want it to be just the same. Um, but I, I thought that that was a that was sort of a cool new version of it that could still stay true to the original. This this episode is like a fun uh, road trip, like uh, Midnight Run, Planes, Trains and Automobiles. You know, uh, is that different than, say, filming, you know, like a procedural crime drama where you're mostly standing sets or something? Just being on location so much and all the action. Well, the, the, I mean, I alluded earlier, it's, it's been a journeyman career. It's like, uh, I've been in it for a long time, but like enough to get health insurance every year, some years, just barely. Um, <laughs> but, but there's a beautiful thing. My wife was on a show for six years called army wives. And in that time I was doing pilots and I was doing guest spots or like a recurring arc and she loved that show and she loved being on it, but I got to have so much fun. Cause like, I'm the guy who shows up and is like a pain in the ass as a jury member in the courtroom. Whereas, you know, the number six on the call sheet has a parking space right out front and a Maserati in it. But in that episode, he just gets to say like seven sentences. And most of them are like, wait a minute. And he gets to say like <laughs> versions of that seven times. So like, a guest spot is almost always fun. Um, a lot of the time I'm there just going, I, 
I couldn't have killed her. I loved her. And you know, <laughs> like that, I've said almost that line on maybe four or five different things. But every now and then you get one that's just a blast. And and this one, yeah, it's it's always fun being a guest star. This in particular was incredible. And the like from day one being on the 70s set um, on the Universal lot, like right on the town green under the clock tower and they've turned it into the seventies was, yeah, it, it, that's, that's kind of the, that takes me back to being a kid and like seeing a play in a theater and then like walking backstage and seeing the sets and being like, it's a castle, but on the back, it's just plywood. <laughs> like you're, that, Jumping into that seventies, elaborate seventies set with all these incredible extras, um, who like were perfect casting for like, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but man, you look just like the guy who would be spending the whole day under the car, changing the oil pan. Like <laughs> it's incredible. And they, and particularly after the strike to come back into um, such a fully realized world was, was so much fun. So much fun. Well, you know, coming off of that, uh, we know that you guys were forced to really hit the ground running. You said you got a weekend phone call uh, right after the strike ended. And I'm curious to know, since it was a little bit of a rush job for you guys to get back into production, when you got on set, were there any unexpected challenges or surprises that, that you hadn't anticipated? Shockingly, no. Uh, it, it's one of the best sets I've ever been on. Um, I would, you know, I would couch it and say if if it weren't, but it, but there really weren't. I mean, it was it was it was stunning. Um, everyone was so appreciative. I think to be back at work for starters, um, but it also seems like that's the way this set goes like it, everyone's loving it. Everyone loves the gig, loves being with everybody. Um, there were, I was there the first day that, um, that Ray saw Mason like walking around and the two of them ran to each other. Like the way my five-year-old daughter runs to a friend, you know, when she sees him on Monday morning at preschool, mm -hmm. um, like they were so, they were giddy excited to see each other. And, um, like everyone, the, the costumes crew is just like laughing the whole time. Everyone, the, the sets were unbelievable. The props people, um, the producers and writers, phenomenal. Um, I'm generally a positive person, but, but this was like 10 out of 10, 20 out of 10. And so, no, there really weren't any, any hiccups that I saw. Um, yeah. And, and I, it wasn't like uh, that didn't necessarily mean like bad things. I mean, maybe positive things as well that just surprised you right. getting on because it's such a dynamic episode. And it's funny. I ask this because when you see the episode, um, it seems fairly straightforward. But we were talking to Joe, the director, Joe Menendez, and he you know, as he was breaking down the scenes when we were doing the commentary, I realized just how much movement is there and how much, so much going into every scene. So I, I have, a, I think, more of an appreciation for all of the stuff that you guys have to keep in mind when you're doing what looks like a deceptively simple scene. Right. So especially since you had to be in a car, the car is flipping over, you know, you have all the location. It's so... I, even things like that, even if not necessarily negative, but just, just the frenetic pace has got to be something. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's testament to, it's, it's hard to pull it off. It's, it's really hard to, to pull off. Um, it's hard to pull off anything. I, I directed a short film 15 years ago and as soon as I'm finished editing it, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, everyone should try and wear everybody's hat a little bit. And then you see, oh my God, that job is, that job's actually really, really difficult. Um, not getting clothes to scratch against the microphone. Like it's incredibly difficult to get good sound on a set and bad sound ruins it, you know? So like 
everybody's job. Everyone's got to be a pro. And, and really, they killed it. And, and yeah, uh, Joe, man, Joe was amazing. Um, on day one, an hour into it, he's talking about a scene. And his he had like a little a chain around his neck with a little ring that was holding his sunglasses. And he had glasses and then sunglasses and he would swap between. He's talking about it. And the, gla it, the glasses flew out hit the ground and exploded in a way that I've never seen anything explode that didn't have a squib attached to it. <laughs> and it happened like right there as he's talking about the scene, he's so animated, fell and they're like truly like exploded. They're, you're not fixing them. Um, they fell in a way that like, it doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> props came up and actually had another pair of glasses like those in the sunglasses kit. And was like, do you want these? And he was like, that, how do you have that? It's <laughs> what we have. We, ha we happen to have those. Um, so like the Joe getting into it, the breaking of the glasses, the quick replacement. All right, let's keep moving. That was the vibe for the whole time. Um, and it required that because, yeah, the, uh, the writer, Alex, who was awesome, um, he said that basically martin was like yeah you want to do that you want to you want to do that but what if, what about if you flooded the basement and he was like i can also flood the basement where the fight's going to be <laughs> um that, like add everything add add all the stuff so even something like me being chained to a toilet and trying to pull it off when there's a camera behind it that toilet's not attached to anything so i have to be pretending i have to be like faking if i actually pull it the whole the whole thing is going to fall apart. Um, so like you have to be, you have to be faking it. And that's just for the gag of the handcuffs on the toilet. So you, you take that to everything else, the car flipping over the explosion of the car with us running away and diving with the real explosion happening behind us. That's real. There's not, they might've sweetened it with a little bit of CGI. I don't even know if they did. I saw the playback and they didn't need to, but like, that's real. The teams that pulled all of this stuff off, it was incredible. All the way down to the guy who was there um, at lunch a few of the days, um, who was just like flipping out about his organic uh, vegan stuff. The, the, guy, <laughs> the guy making uh, avocado toast on the first day there. And he was only there a few of the days, but like his level of excitement on over the avocado toast I was like yeah of course you're on this show everyone <laughs> everyone here is so fired up and is just killing it <laughs> that's that's funny uh i would encourage all of the listeners who are listening to this interview on the main podcast to go over to the youtube channel and watch the director's commentary that we've done with joe menendez because he was talking about that scene in particular with the car blowing up um Correct me if, if my memory is wrong. I think he said you guys were able to get that in one take. Yeah. yeah. And and I was thinking, you better get it in one take. You're going to blow up the car twice? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and that that's also, uh, that's like basically out in the wild. So they're, they're hosing down all of the plants within the like fallout radius. Um yeah, the amount of work that went into that, it, it, crazy. And and we rehearsed the actual moment a ton of times before we really did it live. But um, yeah, I, I have not been on a ton of things where you do it once and it works. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, that was, I would strongly encourage people to go watch Joe's commentary. I want to watch it with Joe's commentary. <laughs> he was awesome. He was really awesome. And, and it's also easy for me to say everything went great because, you know, I, I show up and I do the thing. Um, but, uh, no, for someone, for Joe, like for Joe, for the first AD, for the producers, all of the things to be lined up and in place. Um, it's a, it's a, not even a Herculean, um, feat. It's just like, it's like juggling, you know, or, uh, juggling kittens it's like herding kittens meets <laughs> juggling like i can't even i can't imagine the logistics to pull the whole thing off and yet they did and and we finished most days on time 
Wow. What, what is that day like where you have the explosion behind you and you're diving and running away? I mean, I have to imagine that's most of a day because of safety and then you're doing a stunt. Are you padded up? Did you rehearse it, you know, at a different time or, or was it just like, uh, this is what you're doing today? It, it was only part of the day. Um, wow. It's the sort of thing that on a movie, that would be the day. The rehearsal mm -hmm. would be a day in itself and then the actual stunt would probably be a whole day um and no this was just a part of it like we finished another huge scene um maybe the walking down there was a long walk down the road talking i feel like that was before it was either before or after but yeah that stunt was just part of it and filming the inside of that scene inside as we climb out um yeah, that was just that was just a bit of the day. And then they had a second unit there with the exec producer, Chris Grismer, sort of leading that crew um, with stunt guys doing the car chase. So as we're doing that stunt, there is also another stunt unit doing this. And yeah, that was just the I can't remember the order of things, but I think that was just, you know, that was the before lunch part of the day. <laughs> that's that's amazing. It's great. Wow. And, and you think about this show that every episode is a, a new set, a new wardrobe, a new, like try and recreate a time period, try and recreate, you know, be it a space shuttle, be it a boxing ring. Like it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. There, there is this quality about people that are coming from uh, the other shows in the Garrowverse, like Blind Spot, and I think uh, most notably, besides your role in this episode and Josh's, is maybe uh, the first episode of season two. This took too long, where I think almost everyone in it was from Blind Spot, and uh, there's just this like confidence, and um, uh, it's 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 hard to describe, but like a snarky. Uh, comedy timing it's just all perfect and it's that attitude and i really love that about your character in this episode and i think uh my favorite scene in the episode i've said it a few times now people will hear it watching this but uh, uh when your character is pouring the diamonds out of the teddy bear and lying about it straight to the other people's face <laughs> it's just hilarious what what was filming of that scene like what did was that in the script of the direction a combination of all of it your input? That, like, yeah, the... that, that was in the script. And then, you know, where we only got one take of the exploding car, we were all trying to figure out what's the funniest moment for the diamonds to fall. And and so like that's a that's a blast. I I there's something almost like theatrical about that, of getting to we're doing it live there's another character in this moment and it's the sound of diamonds falling on things and pouring <laughs> out, you know, and when's the right time for that character to enter. Um, and it's, it's fun to like to have an instinct and then to try something else and go back. No, no, the instinct was right. And then camera adjusts a little bit now because of that, maybe the turnaround is a little different and it's a real, um, real, real collaborative with everybody. Um, trying to find like the right moment for a joke to land. It's a little bit like um, like l hearing a stand up talk about preparing an hour of material, you know, that it takes a year and it takes a hundred shows to try it out. And that joke finally worked. Okay, so it's this. Um, that gag with those diamonds falling out, there were, there were a few good versions you know, or a few different funny versions, but then there was a moment where we were all like, oh no, that's it, that's it. That's where the joke is. Mm. Um, and it was a lot of fun uh, working with Joe and working with Alex and working with everybody to like, to find exactly those beats. And, and it's a lot of fun when you sort of, you're all right there, right at the beginning. Like we, like there were some beats where the comedy was obvious, and then we're like, let's try another take. And then we try something else. And we're all like, no, that's, that was not funny. Let's go back to the, let's go back to that thing we did initially that made us laugh. Um, it's a little bit of like, it's, it's jamming in a, like a really weird jazz band, you know, but like, yeah. 
Yeah, that 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 kind of speaks to a question that I, I was going to ask, and I, I think you pretty much answered it. But the character that you had could be so radically unlikable if it had been delivered in a different way. And you have this this wonderful patter, this wonderful just this 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 way about you with the character. I know it all starts on the page with the script, but then you know how much do you bring to that to sort of bring it to life where you thread that needle where this is not just some some jerk that we're forced to endure for an hour, but someone we're laughing with. Uh, because I, I think that was such a strength of the episode was from, from right out of the gate, you're hilarious. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't mean to gush, but <laughs> it was just, it was just a lot of fun to watch. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I got to think that's as hard to pull off as all of the choreographed movements and, you know, all the set pieces and everything. I, I, Almost the opposite was harder. I needed to be, because it, it was, I, I got Midnight Run immediately. I read the first page and was like, oh, Midnight Run. Um, and Charles Grodin is so grumpy <laughs> just that whole time and just has this whole like, uh, just like distaste for all of it. But you still like him the whole time. But if that grumpy isn't in there, then then you don't get the like him in spite of. And so you need the in spite of. And I read it and I thought it was so fun. Uh, I had to, I had to make sure he wasn't too likable in a way. And again, the script does it. The script does 99% of it. Um, if I show up and trust the script, it's going to work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was more so that, so that Ray was kept trying to find the good in this guy, which in most episodes is pretty easy. It's usually, it's usually right there um, for him to keep trying to find the good and this guy to continually be like, no, that's not it. Keep looking. <laughs> um, I, I had to, I had to make sure that that was there and that, and that he wasn't actually so super likable that you still felt this like, oh, this guy sucks, but I like him. You got to have that this guy sucks first for the other part to work. You and Josh had great chemistry in, in the episode, Josh Dean. Uh, what was it like working together, you two? I, I want to I spin off show about our relationship. Like that, <laughs> that was one that was, that was tough not to just be like improv, batting it back and forth all the time. And there would be some moments where it's like, Oh, we're about to roll. Oh, okay. Sorry. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> All right, let's do that. Um, we were having a blast. Um, I, I texted him a couple days ago to like, I said, let's just cut to the chase. Like, how do we become best friends? Like, is it, should we go get a coffee or something? And he hasn't responded. So I think I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to have to, like, is that too forward? Sorry. I'll, let me, let me dial it back. How do we hang out a little bit more? Um, but yeah, it was, we had a blast, a blast. He was awesome. Um, and I had spoken about his character, my character in blind spot spoke about his character and kind of talked trash about him. So that was nice, um, to have a, a fictitious history of talking trash about somebody before they, um, before you actually meet them. It's just sort of, that's a nice way to break the ice. <laughs> But yeah, he is, he's like a, he is a rare improv comedic beast. I mean, he's just, yeah, he's, he's, he's always ready for the yes and, yes and, yes and. And that, that was, the, that was a blast. I definitely felt that in the scene where you were like hugging, shaking hands at the end. That was, that was really good. Yeah, I, I. I want to see what the finished version looks like. Cause there were, there were a ton of alts of that scene of a few scenes, but like that scene in particular of like what our conversation is, I, it probably, it probably didn't make it or you can tell me, but it, the, what our conversation is before he comes out of like, uh, br brick a hashish, I think something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, there, yeah. There yeah. was there was a lot of good stuff. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if this is going to come through over the camera, but he um, 
we we really like I really like ribbing him about um about his outfit. <laughs> um, and so I made a, I made this. There's no way this is gonna come through. I made this as a fake uh, album cover. <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. Can you read it? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Belvedere's Belvedere's lament. lament. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment where him sitting in that farmhouse in all of that period clothing was like, "Oh, you're Mr. Belvedere." I, that's it. <laughs> I've been waiting to put. Yeah, that's it. Uh, working with Connor, uh, working with a kid. He was great. Uh, kid actors are awesome, and I, I, um, my, my daughter asked some sort of circuitous questions the other day about how how is a TV show made. She's watching a show, uh, Ricky, Nikki, Dicky, and Dawn, right now. And there's some kids around her age on it. So she was asking, like, how does that get made? And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, if, if she really expressed an interest, I would, I would help her get into it. But I think being a kid actor is a, is a tough gig. And, and Connor was great. Like, he's, he's having the best time. Um, and I think that's important, like, to – to be there and be um, sort of uh, to be mature enough to do it, to do the work, but also be kid enough to eat mostly ice cream at lunch. <laughs> it's like it's it's very important because these kids are are sort of missing a typical childhood, and uh, and so uh, I loved him, and he he's such a he he has such a great child energy. Um, and yet, you know, can get ready when it's time to do the work that, uh, that, that was really great. Um, I made the mistake of showing him a magic trick and then he's like, you teach me everything, you know, um, and so that was like, that, that took up like a whole day and I was like, all right, I need to, I'm just going to go get some water. He's like, wait, 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 but where is the card the whole time? I'm like, okay, all right, <laughs> here, you gotta do this. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed working with him too. That's awesome. That's the perfect age to learn magic. I think 10. Yeah. Oh, totally. That's pretty cool. Totally. I, it hooked me at that age. Mm -hmm. Same. Uh, the, 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 we got to talk about the action at, at the end of the episode in the wet basement and the fight scene and the, the BB gun. You, uh, talk us through that day of filming. You're standing in water for how long? It's crazy. Uh, that, that was a long one. Um, and I, uh, I, I just got my feet wet. And for the most part, I jump up on the weight bench and I'm watching them. And there's a pass where it's, it's a close up pass for my reactions, but they're still doing the action because one camera is getting them from another angle. Easiest acting ever. Um, <laughs> and the stunt people, some people were phenomenal. The, the uh, primary cast was phenomenal. They're all really going for it. Um, even if you're inside and like it's temperature regulated, it's freezing. Um, and I had, I had these leather loafers that I can't remember the make of them, but they kept the water out for like an hour. And it's definitely not the intention of those loafers. So not only was I not getting wet, my feet weren't even wet for like the first hour of full submersion right up to the edge of this loafer. Um, and so, you know, between takes, they're like giving the like diving coats and people are like shivering and then stealing themselves to like do another take. And I'm just up on the weight bench going like, this is great. <laughs> that was a great punch. That was, oh, man. oh, she kicked him. Oh, um, yeah, that, that was awesome. I it's it's great to be in a scene where you can actually just react to what's going on. Cool. It just it, that that was one of the more elaborate things that because it, it goes by so quickly because it's so masterfully edited that um, you don't realize how many moving parts there are. And uh, just the fact that you're able to hit your marks with everything that was going on, the way you came in with that BB gun <laughs> and, uh, you know, like knock the stunt person in the face. How many times did you have to practice that? There's got to be a safety thing going on there. Yeah. And you practice with a rubber gun. A lot of times, 
but then it's also just movie magic. Like if you looked at that from another angle, it would be mm-hmm. like, yeah, <laughs> like you're five feet away. Yeah, for, the, for the listening audience, it's yeah, it, <laughs> it, it it is the there's a full foot and a half, two feet between her face and that gun. Um, mm-hmm. But that's another thing. Back to your earlier question about being surprised by anything. I think the only thing I was surprised by was that we got to do all the bits. A fight like that would typically be the one thing in an episode. And that was just like one of so many things. Jump off the bus, blow up the car, that big fight sequence. Um, There were so many moments in that episode, um, you know, that there was a, that the stunt people had created the choreography and that we then rehearsed it one day and then we shoot it the next day. And again, that's just part of those days. Um, I, I was, I was constantly surprised that, that they were packing all of this in there. I think that it's, if anyone hasn't seen it, I think you're, I think it's, I think you're going to love it. I don't always watch everything that I'm in, not because I have a philosophical view about it. Just, I think, you know, the experience for me is there when I'm doing it. Um, and then, uh, if it's something that I really love the experience, I'll want to watch it afterwards. But then also just like kids in life, I'm kind of moving on to whatever the next thing is. Um, this is one because of all of those bits. I, I can't wait to see how it all came out. And then also Quantum Leap, like getting to be a part of the Quantum Leap, like extended lore is another one of those. We're just like, I can't believe it. Like uh, pinch me. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. So uh, wh- where can we expect to see you next? You got anything on the horizon? It's just, it's family fan. I'll be taking my 15 year old dog out to go to the bathroom around 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> in the deepest moment of REM. Um, you know, that I'll be dropping my kids off at their two different schools because we couldn't streamline that. Um, no, I, I, I do, I do. I'm editing a music video right now and I'm really oh, excited cool. about that. Um, an actor named Ben Barnes, who was, uh, he was like the black hat, one of the black hat, uh, characters in season one of Westworld. Uh, I think he's like, oh, the yeah. guy right now, um, Love he has Westworld. an album coming out, beautiful singer. And so I'm, I'm editing a music video for him and I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm, I've got a writing project that I'm very excited about. So there's some, some other stuff going on like that. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. I, I thought the video was going to be for, uh, the first single from Mr. Belvedere's Lament. <laughs> no, but I, I, I do need to include, um, I need to send you that picture. It was, it says 12 songs in the oddity of being a British Manny and four all color knock, knock jokes. <laughs> that's mr belvedere's lament um and you know if josh wanted to make uh, a song i think that i think we could do that <laughs> uh and uh you're you're now uh your character is hannah's brother-in-law so uh if you got a chance to come back would you come back to quantum leap i, I was i i Another way you could ask that is, how were you pitching your return to Quantum Leap while you were on set? Um, yeah, I would love to. I, I, I had so much fun in the blind spot world and playing in Martin's like really smart, really action driven world. Like it's so fun when the two can live together. And um, and I I think that this is um, I think. I think uh, it's sort of a, a match made in heaven for him to be running this iteration of Quantum Leap. Um, I would, I'd come back in a, I'd, I would come back in a heartbeat. I was um, pitching that. Oh, when uh, in season one, when Magic is talking about, he felt a knock on his heart. I just thought that was like that was the coolest thing to get into. The, oh man, it gives me goosebumps thinking about that reveal. Um, what's it like on the other side of someone being leapt into? Like, what is that actually like? Um, and I'd some I'd never thought about that watching the show the first time through. Um, 
But that was such a cool detail. And so my pitch is that uh, Ben needs to jump into Kevin and Kevin keeps saying no. <laughs> <laughs> and so the episode, for whatever reason, you get him there like for a moment and then it's almost like the scene in Ghost where Whoopi Goldberg is like, get out of me. Um, <laughs> that like you, you get Ben there and Kevin's like, no, no, no. <laughs> but that's that's that was my pitch for somewhere down the road i'm picturing like uh lily tomlin steve martin all of me like redo that with you too <laughs> totally totally that's <laughs> great and that feels like in the midnight run sort of yeah that's mm -hmm. perfect the the kevin sequel within quantum leap is is lily tomlin yeah that's perfect <laughs> i love that that's great that'll go in the pitch i'll send i'll All send right. some emails around that's great Give awesome. me credit for that. i would i would totally watch that you can have that one well and that's there's also something so fun about a show that that goes back and forth in time that you know in in the old days if your character dies you can only show up in dreams or if you have a twin um and uh and so those are so sort of played out but in this one yeah like we can you can anyone can show back up at any point in time um and so that's where like i'm there's definitely no plan to bring me back um but, uh, <laughs> you know hopefully i was fun enough that they're like maybe let's where mm -hmm. where could we when they need to leap into brazil for season three there you that's go it. There you go. That's, that's, it. that's, that's where it. Kevin wound up. So, yep. and to Why see, not? yeah, to see, has he changed? Has he not? Like for right. Kevin to become like a an ally in this in some way, love it. Cool, very cool. Not to gush about the whole thing, but it was just so great. Uh, Caitlin, I didn't mention her. She was great. It was awesome working with her. It's such a it's such a weird gig that she has, um, and she handles it so well. Uh, it's, it's, it's so much fun to try and not look at someone who's speaking and making sense and like affecting the mm. world around you. And, um, and it has to be a weird psychological thing for her to be like, Oh, here's another person who's literally pretending I don't exist. <laughs> that's, like a, that's like a nightmare of people, you know? Um, and like, that's what actually happens all the time, literally pretending she doesn't exist. So that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, she was great to work with as well. Um, and then Eliza was in the episode too, and she was great. Like it, it was, it, it's just a, it's an awesome, awesome group of people. Well, we're so glad that uh, you keep uh, the tradition up of everybody saying what a wonderful set this uh this new quantum leap is and just the environment and our uh before we go we don't want to keep you too much longer you've been so generous with your time but do you have um any messages or words for uh the leapers listening out there uh, i'm i'm one of you um i think that's that's it i'm i'm one of you i um i think about the season finale or series finale of the first run and like it gives me chills just thinking about it um yeah, so that's that's it. I'm one of you, and it would like, what a treat to get to go play in this world. There's one of my first big gigs was in a western, and everyone was like, "Can you believe you're in a western?" And I was like, "I can't believe I'm getting paid to act on television. Like, <laughs> who cares what it is?" And so, but afterwards, I saw like, oh yeah, the goal for everyone is to do a western. Like, it's ultimate dress up, and uh, and there are a few different people and a few different shows that that are like a dream to be on and to get to do quantum leap. Like that's a dream. That's a dream for me. Well, we're happy to be here uh, as your dream has come true, David. Thank you so much for being with us on the quantum leap podcast. All right. Great. Thank you guys for having me. I hope everyone enjoyed the episode and um, yeah, stay tuned for uh, Josh Dean's single, Mr. Belladier's lament. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. David, thank you very much for your time, for that insight, for being such a goof. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, 
I hadn't mentioned this earlier in the show, but David isn't the only interview, Allison, that we got for this. Um, yeah? Yeah, Albie and I also spoke to Josh Teen, who played Josh, the husband Josh, poor doomed Josh. <laughs> and uh, he was great. So if you want to hear his take on all this stuff that might touch upon some of the stuff that that David talks about, you can see that interview with Josh on the after show. You can watch that after you listen to this with Albie and Hayden. And I think Brian Green is on the after show and John Irons. So they got a full house over there. And in addition to this interview with David and the interview with Josh, we also have interviews with cowboy hat gun toting Chevelle driver G. Alexander. He played the hitman. Whoa. Whoa, and yeah, I'll raise you another woe because Albie and I also recorded an episode commentary with director Joe Menendez. It's like the first time I've ever done anything like this, and it was so amazing to sit with Joe and listen as he discussed the episode with Albie and me, telling us everything that went on behind the scenes and how the shots were put together, and it's just, it's phenomenal. So everybody who is listening to this, I'm telling you, you gotta, when you're done listening to this, when you're done watching the after show, go to our YouTube channel, find that director's commentary with Joe Menendez, fire up this episode on Peacock, and just get ready to have a ball watching along because it was amazing. So, so much good stuff coming out of this episode. What good gets? So yeah, so much stuff going on. It is phenomenal to me how we've hit the ground running. And um, again, this is stuff that Matt used to just take care of and he would have everything lined up. But Albie has just come in and he's doing it and he's, he's excelling. It's just keeping up the Quantum Leap podcast tradition. Yeah, as soon as uh, we knew who was uh, in the episode and uh, who to contact, like Albie was just on it, you know, doing a great job. Doing a great job. It felt really good to come back to the show. As we mentioned up top, I mean, I had some anxiety about coming on mic today and doing the first show without Matt. Me too. Right? It's just weird. It's just so unutterably strange. Let's just put it out there. I mean, this is, it's new for both of us, but I was anxious about doing the interview with Josh and doing the interview with David, but just getting back into the swing of it with Albie, I mean, just having a lot of fun and really coming at it in a fun way and being in a good place with this, that to me is a blessing, despite everything that's happened. And, um, you know, it'll never be the same as it was, but at least I feel like we have a way forward together. Which is, yeah. yeah, to me, that's that's an amazing thing. So anyway, I don't mean to get maudlin. Uh, hey, this is where I usually talk about new patrons. Um, we don't have any updates, but um, in the wake of Matt's passing since we went on hiatus, I had suspended uh, all of the, the patronage stuff because we weren't producing anything. I just want to let everybody know that um, we're accepting payments again. We're accepting new subscribers if you want to check us out. Uh, and support the show on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash quantum leap podcast. So while we're on the subject of Matt, I also wanted to share some feedback. I mentioned this at the top of the show. I've been in touch with Matt's partner, Sharon, since all this has gone down and she has expressed her gratitude to me, you know, in different ways about how grateful she is for all of the fan support and how the community rallied around uh, when they heard what happened. So uh, they had the GoFundMe site active and it's still active. Uh, You guys can go there. There'll be the link in the show notes if you want to continue to support Matt's uh, family, Sharon and Zach. Uh, They're still accepting donations to benefit them. But as part of the update on the GoFundMe site, Sharon posted the following message. She writes, in what has been the hardest week of my life, I've been able to take comfort in the love and generosity so many people have shown since Matt's passing. It's clear that Matt had such a positive impact on everyone he met, either in person or online, and that he will be dearly missed by a great many people. It's unlikely I'll ever be able to express fully how much it means, but thank you to everyone who has contributed through donations and messages of support. I promise to do all of you and Matt proud. Sharon. Sharon, thank you so much for giving that message. Um, I'm happy to have something to share with the fan community. 
I know that a lot of people have been blindsided by what has happened and maybe had not seen this. So I just want everybody out there listening to know how much everything you've done is appreciated by Matt's family. We also got some words of gratitude from Matt's best friend, Kevin West, who was also his collaborator on Beyond the Mirror Image. Uh, he sent this to me in a direct message on Facebook Messenger. Do you want to uh, read this one, Allison? Sure. Just wanted to say how much I love the messages put out by the QLP accounts. They and the responses to them have been beautiful to see. I've cried lots of happy tears seeing how much Matt was appreciated and loved. The messages from the QL cast, producers, and writers were just so perfect. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. It it means a lot to us that it means a lot to you. And um, we will feature much more extensive feedback from you, the listeners, in an addendum to that Blind Faith show. So the way I'm looking at that show, Allison, is I want to present it the way we recorded it in its entirety as if, you know, nothing had happened because it's a snapshot of where we were and kind of the last thing we all did together. And I want it to be yeah. as pristine as possible, but I'll probably put an intro on it to introduce it a little bit. And then I would like to maybe record some more messages to put on after the end of it. But I, I do want that to be a complete record of, of the last thing we did together. And again, I'll get into all this when I intro it, but just, just so everybody knows, we received your messages. We're not ignoring them. We do plan to highlight them. Uh, it will just be in a different context than right now. So uh, just, just rest assured that, that we hear you. We love you. We are grateful for the support. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So if you out there want to tell us what you think about Off the Cuff or anything that might be on your mind, Quantum Leap related, there are many ways that you can reach us here at the Quantum Leap podcast. You can write us a letter at P.O. Box 542, Bayport, New York, 11705. You can get us by phone at 707-847-6682. You can email us at quantumleappodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash quantumleappodcast. You can hit us up on Instagram at at Quantum Leap Podcast or X at Quantum Leap Pod. And you can watch us on YouTube and comment there at youtube.com slash the Quantum Leap Podcast. You can always go that extra mile as well and support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Quantum Leap Podcast. Just remember that we may use your response in an upcoming episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. This is usually the time when I throw to Matt to say, hey, what's coming up next? Uh, I want to throw to you, Allison, to say, hey, what's coming up next? And I think that I just figured out what's coming up next because I didn't know what the, <laughs> what the title of the next oh. episode was. Yeah, no, I have it. Oh, you, I do. You, oh, you do. But... You do. Because okay. Drew, I asked Drew. I reached out to Drew Lindo and he did. Oh, he gave there was me... a, a release about yeah, it. Yeah, I missed it. I missed it completely. So, hey, okay. Allison, speaking of uh, upcoming episodes, tell us what's coming up next. Well, next we have the episode Family Treasure. A cursed treasure hunt draws Ben to Mexico in 1953, putting him between two estranged siblings struggling with their late father's legacy. As they navigate a series of lethal obstacles, Ben finds the real challenge lies in repairing this broken family's bond. Lots of bringing uh, brothers and siblings and stuff together. Oh my god, this sounds it's so all about freaking cool. Quantum Leap, your family. I'm the, yeah, we're family. We're, we're, <laughs> we're family. Fam we're family on globetrotting adventures. <laughs> <laughs> on globetrotting adventures. Mexico in 1953. Treasure hunt. It's like romancing the stone. Man, yeah. I'm dating myself, but this sounds so cool. Romancing the stone's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right instead of this one Joan Wilder yeah I watched that as much as I watched Raiders growing up because we had them on the same VHS tape so we just played it on a they're loop they're kind of in a similar ilk yeah yeah, yeah they are completely, completely. Get it on the same VHS tape like recorded off TV recorded off Showtime or HBO yeah and you always put the Sweet. VHS tape on um, what the, the super long play because you get six hours out of that. So there was probably oh, another movie yeah. on after Romancing the Stone, but I don't remember what it was. So anyway, uh, that's a long way of me saying, hey, I like this genre and I can't wait to see yeah. how they play it up in the next episode. And I can't wait to talk about it with you, Allison. It's been really great to have you back. Oh, thank you. I mean, this is, uh, you know what? I was nervous getting on mic too, but I think like it's, it's been really good. I think like we've bounced off each other really well and... Uh, I like the energy, and um, I hope that we've done we've done Matt proud. Yeah, me too. I think we still got that old magic, so 
Thank you for being part of the show. Thank you all for listening. I cannot wait to talk about the Romancing the Stone episode. Until that time, I have been Christopher D. Phillips. And I've been Allison Pregler. And we'll see you in the jungles of Mexico. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Quantum Leap podcast, hosted by Allison, Matt, and Chris, with voice talent and contributions from Hayden McQueenie and Zoe Dean. To support the show, please go to patreon.com slash quantum leap podcast. The executive producer of the Quantum Leap podcast is Albert Burge. Christopher D. Philippus and Hayden McQueenie are the co-executive producers. Special thanks to our producers, Harold Sullivan, Glenda Palma, Chris, a.k.a. Brackmang, Mike Covert, Jeff Kiska, Craig Riedler, Cosplay Dad, Charles Allen Gossard, and Morgan Felden. The thoughts expressed on this podcast are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent those of the Quantum Leap podcast, its partners, or affiliates. The Quantum Leap universe and all it contains is the property of Belisarius Productions and Universal Television. The Quantum Leap podcast is not affiliated with Belisarius Productions or Universal Television, and no copyright infringement is intended. The Quantum Leap podcast is a barren space production. Oh, that Tom? I love that Tom. Hey, Tom. Oh, my God. Tom looked at me. Tom, I love you, Tom.